So congratulations for being here. I'm so happy that you have carved this time out. Everyone has had a long break. You see a couple of students on the screen here who you're going to meet in a moment, and they've been talking about the fact that they're so ready for the semester to start. So we thought, why don't we do something, given the situation in 2020, which was not what any of us had planned, why don't we do something virtual together to give you all of these new insights to help you reach your career goals? And honestly, I could not be more excited. This is how I normally am. I have had no coffee. I have only water in front of me because we've never done this before. We've never gathered with over 400 people live and talked about these conversations. We've never brought experts from around our campus who are amazing career professionals together to share their best stuff. And we have some alumni from companies that will be joining us this afternoon too. So hang on for the ride. If you need to go on a run and pop your headphones in while you're listening, feel free, make your lunch, do whatever you need to do. We are webinar style today. That's a little different than your Zoom meetings you had last semester for class. This may be your first webinar. You cannot unmute, you cannot show your camera, but you can type in questions. So we have some wonderful people here to answer your questions. And the first person I'm going to introduce is Graham Pittman, and he is going to explain to you, tell you who he is, and explain to you how to use the Q&A feature. So welcome, Grant. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for, for showing up to today's webinar. Um, I'm going to explain how the Q&A works. So we aren't going to use the chat to ask questions. We think it might get a little crazy. Um, so we've set up a Q&A. And the Q&A should allow you to type in a question, of course, and you should be able to see questions posed um, by other attendees. And when an attendee asks a question, you should be able to see a little thumbs up icon. And if you click on that, it's kind of telling us it's an upvote. So it's telling us this is a question that I have too. Um, so make sure, you know, if you don't want to type out a long question and see if someone else has the same question you have and upvote it if you want that to be answered. And um, Courtney is going to be kind of going through the Q&A a lot to answer questions. Um, and we might reserve a few of them to be answered live. So be on the lookout for, for answers to your questions in the Q&A section. Thank you, Grant. Grant is a senior in economics. He is my teaching assistant. He's fantastic. He's behind the scenes um, monitoring all of your questions and our amazing Courtney Mulvini, who is a professional in the Career Development Center with years of experience working with these kinds of questions, is now waving and smiling. She will be here also to answer your questions. So be listening and looking at your Q&A. We also did a Padlet ahead of time. Some of you asked questions ahead of time on the Padlet, and we have answered those there too. So we'll pop that link in the chat in a few minutes as well, so that you can see the answer or you can just go back to the Padlet link. You probably already have it. The next person I want to introduce is Sari Paquette. Sari is going to launch our first poll for today and say hello to everyone. Hi, guys. Okay, I'm going to launch the poll and you guys can just answer it. So Sari is my teaching assistant as well for career exploration, and she is studying business here at NC State. And the poll is now up, Wolfpack fans. So you get to answer which answer best describes your summer plans. We're all here because we want to achieve something in the summer of 2021. It might be a co-op, it might be an internship. Some of you are seniors, you might be wanting your first job, maybe you want to get into graduate school. So we're gonna take a look here at the answers to your questions and we'll have a couple of fun polls throughout today to keep everyone engaged. So I think we have given everyone a nice amount of time to answer that so we can end the polling, Sari and we can see the results, which say most of you um, have not applied yet or started applying. So we've got over half of you. You're just at the beginning. I'm so glad you're here. Literally pat yourself on the back for that. You, you know, you're, you're amazing to carve this time out. You could be watching Netflix and you're here. 
It's going to be better than Bridgerton or whatever else you're watching right now. I have started applying, yay, for 35% of you. You're on the move there. I've started interviewing 9%, and I have accepted an offer 6%. So this is a wonderfully diverse group, and we are going to help all of you get to that point where you say, I have accepted the offer. That's what the NC State Career Development office center is here to do is to support you so that you could all say that you're going to learn so many resources today we'll pack fans so our students are now going to be muting their cameras and be on the back end answering your questions along with courtney if you would like to do speaker view that might be your best view for this conversation this afternoon um, so that you will see the person speaking if you are watching this on demand because we're recording Welcome, welcome, bring your own sunshine. I always say BYOS if it is a rainy, cloudy day in January or February when you watch this, but it's actually beautiful. I'm over in the North Carolina Biotechnology Center today. You might see that on the podium. And I'm so excited that NCBC has offered us their beautiful conference space today to record this webinar. This is in Durham. So I'm, I'm, it's a sunny day here in the Research Triangle Park. And companies can come to the North Carolina Biotechnology Center and utilize this beautiful conference center. They also have a wonderful job board for you students who are in the sciences. So absolutely check that out. I'm very grateful for our employer partner that is offering up their space today. So you see one more face on the screen, Wolfpack fans. I would love to invite Anna Valegia to join the conversation. Hi, Anna. Hello, Marcy. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. We're delighted to have you. I want to tell you about Anna. She is the director of the alumni career area. So when you think about graduating and you think about, oh, now I'm out in the workforce and can I utilize resources? Um, Anna is Director of Alumni Career Services. So we brought an amazing expert to kick off our conversation on LinkedIn. And you can actually meet with her for your first year after you graduate. Plus, you can join the Alumni Society or Association. And once you're a member, you have the ability to have more conversations with Anna. And her fun fact, I love this fun fact. I was reading it on my, um, as my husband and I drove in for this webinar today, I was like, this is the funnest fun fact. No one's going to top this, Anna. It is that she had her baby exactly the same day as her sister had her baby. So they call themselves twin cousins. That's amazing, Anna. Thank you for being here today. And please correct anything I said about your role and tell us about LinkedIn. Yeah, well, thank you again for having me, Marcy. It's so good to see you. And I am impressed for how many students have selected to be a part of this event. You are one step ahead of so many others. And I think it's wonderful that you're here. And I know Marcy has a wonderful day planned for you. So um, yeah, I mean, LinkedIn, there's so much that we could talk about. I know uh, it's a very, uh, it's one of the best resources out there, truthfully, for any sort of job seeker. So I'm excited just to touch on a few things. Um, and Marcy, we can kind of go through some things together too, because I think that there's just a lot to it. And I know you have some really great videos that you're going to show. So hopefully some of the things that we talk about won't overlap too much or they'll just be re-emphasized. But one of the things that I will just talk about really quickly with LinkedIn that I talk a lot with about with my alumni is just making connections with other people who have other similarities to you. So one of the things that I think is really important is LinkedIn is a social media tool. And it's a great way to be able to reach out to other people just for many, many reasons. And I think today, one of the reasons is probably for a job search. And I definitely think that LinkedIn is a huge part of jo any job search strategy. It's not just about applying online, it's about making connections. And LinkedIn is one of the be best avenues that you can possibly take in order to make some of those connections. So um, yeah, I totally agree with you, Anna. And I'm just going to add in the fact that I mean, you and I, we work with employers every day. And when an employer has, um, maybe they're advertising a position, one of the first things they do is Google the applicants and hopefully you're LinkedIn, right? It's gonna be the first thing that comes up, don't you think? 
Absolutely. And I worked with an alum that said it, I think the best, it, LinkedIn can work when you're not working, right? So when you're sleeping or you're taking a test, your LinkedIn is up, it's running, it's 24 seven, it's working for you. You don't have to do anything at that moment, which I think is incredible because it's just building your brand um, without you having to actively do things. Now, there's a lot of things you can actively do on it, which we'll definitely talk about. But I do think that's one thing that's great is that it can really be working for you and kind of showcase your great experience and um, what you're wanting to do when you don't have to actually be attending a career fair or going to an interview, it's doing the work for you. Yeah, it's so true. It's it's up there for anyone to find. And you know, if if the students listening today are like most of the ones I talk to, I hear this so many times, oh my gosh, I've got to get to that. I need to get that professional headshot. I need to get a headline up there. I need to post my LinkedIn. And it's just been on your list to do. And it's so important, right, Anna? Absolutely. And your profile is actually 14 times more likely to be viewed if you have a picture. Um, and it's it's easier now than ever to get one of those professional pictures done. So unfortunately, we're not doing a lot of in-person events right now, but at, all, at virtually any in-person career event, we do have the option to do professional headshots. You know, now with how nice iPhones are and different <laughs> smartphones, you can get a friend to take one that looks professional, but I do think that's really important. And obviously the other things that you talked about as well are crucial, but I think, you know, control what you can. And I think getting a really nice LinkedIn headshot is a great starting point. That is such a good starting point. And I also wanted to hear your opinion on the idea of reaching out for connection requests. I know a lot of students are nervous about who should they reach out to and how do they go about that? What are your thoughts, Anna? Absolutely, and this is what I encourage folks to do all the time. So if you, I, I kind of have just like five top tips that will run through, it won't take too long, but the first and foremost, I think find some sort of commonality with somebody on LinkedIn. So there's a really great alumni feature on LinkedIn where you can see who went to NC State, just like your current student, everybody on this site is also um, an alum of NC State. So that could be a really great way to find a commonality or maybe it's the same um, type of degree that you have. Maybe you have similar interests. Maybe this person works for a company that you're dying to work for, but just find a commonality first. I mean, that's the, really the best place to start and that's what networking is all about. And then when you reach out, I sort of call this the golden rule of LinkedIn. So reach out the way in which you would want to be contacted. So I know I don't wanna get a LinkedIn request from somebody being like, hey, I see you work at NC State, who can you tell me to connect with? Like that's not, that doesn't feel great. It's not really how I wanna be approached, but if they say, hey, I see you have really great experience at NC State, I'd love to connect with you and learn more about what the Alumni Association does and how it's structured, whatever that might be, you have to have a reason for connecting. But I do think that reaching out to somebody in a way that feels comfortable to you. Cause it can be really a strange feeling. I know some people do not like the idea of reaching out and networking and connecting with other people. So just think about it. If somebody were to reach out to you, how would you like to be approached? So that's one of the key things that I like to, to tell people to think about. Um, always customize your message. You don't want some blank generic template. No one wants that. It's very obvious. You want it to feel personalized. So, you know, give the person credit if they've been at the same company for 10 years, like say how impressive that is, or if they have a very similar degree, call that out. So just make sure that the message is customized to the person that you're trying to reach. Um, one thing, and this is sort of getting into a little bit of specifics, but <clears throat> If you are adding somebody on LinkedIn and you connect and then add a note, LinkedIn does not keep up with all of those notes unless the person responds back to you. So just keep up with who you're reaching out to. I think it's a great way to kind of showcase your efforts in the job search and what you've been doing. So in case LinkedIn's not keeping up with it, that's something that you should be doing on your own. And I think it'll just show you, you'll be proud of yourself for how many people you've tried to reach out to um, and the response rate I think will, will be encouraging too. Um, and then just don't give up, keep trying, keep following up. If there's somebody that you really wanna connect with on LinkedIn, you can send the message on LinkedIn. You can find them on EPAC potentially. You can send them an email. Maybe you can find their information on some other great resources that we have on campus like Career Shift. But you can definitely find other ways to follow up. So don't let that be your last point of contact. Really try to make sure that you're engaging and um, really making that connection, not just sending a one-way conversation. Those are such great tips, Anna. I know that, like you said, if you just 
I know sometimes I'm lazy and I'm just like, oh, can I just click the connect button? And then, like you said, we get that generic, I don't know who this person is. Should I say yes? Should I say no? And so this is the kind of employee you'll be when you're hired. You're that go the extra mile person. And if you do that from the start with that customized request, request like I love what you said about find a commonality maybe you both studied textiles at NC State so now you've got a connection and Anna do you find most alums are pretty open to wanting to give back to the Wolfpack family and make these connections 100%. So I work with alums all the time and some that are looking for work and some that are employers and seeking talent. And they always want to connect with NC State alums, students, alums, they want to help. And I would say use the fact that you're a student to your advantage. This is a time in your life where people want to help you more than ever. And so I would just say use that and they've all been in your shoes. And I will tell you, I have a group of employers that I work with that are all NC State alums and they constantly ask me how they can help current students. They love doing that. They love to give back. And so when you reach out and I think too, some people want to give back, but they don't always know how, like some alums want to be able to help you. They don't know how to do that. So if you're reaching out, you can give them that opportunity and they will be appreciative and want to do what they can to help you. I totally agree. And I'm glad you've seen that same thing, especially during this global pandemic, Wolfpack fans. I can't tell you how many alums have been, how can I help your students? I can't imagine what it would be like to be in college during a pandemic where you're taking classes from your room, bedroom from high school, or you can't come back to campus. They want to help you. And we're actually having an event coming up February 21st. And Courtney's gonna be popping the link into the chat where you can register for the career con event, kind of like Comic-Con. It's a Sunday afternoon and we have 50, 5-0 alumni coming to that event on that Sunday. And we're going to do breakout rooms in that one. We're going to let you go into the room with the alums that relate most to your career goal. Maybe you want a cre creative job in the future, or you want to work in a STEM field or something in business or humanities. All of these alums said, uh, sign me up. I will be there on a Sunday. This is time I spend with my family. And that's going to be from 1 until 5 p.m. So this is meant to be a warm-up for CareerCon. Um, but we got a lot of y'all interested on your break to come to boot camp. So we're so excited about that. And um, we'll, you'll get more publicity on that later. But definitely put a big star on your calendar for February 21st on that Sunday to tune in on Zoom. And Anna, what do you think about following up? I think there is also a fear that you might be bugging people if they don't respond. Should you be persistent? Yeah, I mean, people are busy. You know, people have, and they might have all intentions of getting back to you. And it just kind of maybe gets keep pushing down or some people aren't the best at managing their LinkedIn or they don't look at it as often. So you just don't know how they want to be approached. So sometimes if you try on LinkedIn, maybe you haven't gotten a response, there are different ways to get their information, like their email address and different ways that you can kind of get that contact. But I would absolutely say to be persistent. I, I think one time it's not, it's probably not enough. Like, like I said, people get really busy and they may have all intentions of getting back to you and it just, might just get lost in their inbox. So I think one more, and obviously be respectful when you follow up, but you can just say, you know, if you follow up on LinkedIn first and then maybe you find their email, you can say, hey, I reached out to you on LinkedIn, just wanted to send a quick follow up and kind of reference what it is that you want to talk about or follow up with them on LinkedIn. And maybe there's something new that happened, like you saw a new job posting, or you talked to somebody else from the organization that suggested that they reach out to you. So I would just say, just keep trying. I mean, there's a certain point where you can get obnoxious, but normally you start to feel that. <laughs> um, I don't know, Marcy, do you have a hard and fast rule of how many times? I would definitely say be persistent. I love being persistent and I don't think of it as being aggressive. I think of it as being assertive, especially people socialized as women are often taught, you know, don't be too bold, but here's a thing you want them to see that you're going to be the kind of employee that goes that extra mile. And that if they give you something to do, you follow up and make sure it gets done. Nothing falls through the cracks with you. So I think a follow-up like 
maybe once a month, just to update someone on your progress, send them an article you think is interesting, tag them in a post. That kind of keeps the relationship fresh. Absolutely. So I'm going to do a couple screen shares now, um, students. And before I do that, Anna, is there anything else um, you would like to add about our, um, our LinkedIn? And I'm going to show a few demos here. No, I mean, I think just keep it updated, utilize it. It's such a great resource that I know has so many different functionalities. So there's not just applying. It's not just keeping your profile updated. Marcy's is going to talk about a lot of other ways that you can use it, but just utilize it. It's a wonderful resource and has so many benefits. And I just commend everybody for being here. Thank you so much for having me and yeah. um, good luck. And I hope everybody attends the other event too, because that is a wonderful upcoming event as well. So best of luck with everything. And thanks, Anna. We know you got to run and do some other things. Thanks for being here. We loved having you. So the Thank first you. screen share I'm showing is Ronnie. And hopefully you can see that. I'll have one of my TAs unmute if you cannot see it. Uh, so, Because I don't see your pictures at this point. So one of the things I love about this profile is she has got a wonderful headshot. It can just be the top of your body. It does not have to show anything fancy as far as a suit that you're wearing. And she has this great background picture. She wants to do something in science. So she has something splashy here. And check out her actual headline. This is not student at NC State. That is one in 40,000 people. You're so much more unique than that, students. So she has pulled out these key words that if someone was to search for her, that would pop up immediately. So I wanted to point that out as an example to you. And then the next profile I wanna show you is Alusha Thomas. So one of the things I like here, she is very into teamwork. So she shows herself with a team, lovely headshot. She's got the suit happening here, looking professional. Think about the kind of company you wanna work for. Maybe you need a suit there, right? Maybe it's a tech company in Silicon Valley. You're gonna hear from two alums in a few minutes that work at those companies and they wear hoodies. So just kind of keep in mind what the audience is. But what I wanted to show you about Lucia is her about section. So you have 2000 characters here, students. And what I want you to do is utilize this about section to really tell your story. And Lucia did an amazing job on that. So what she does is she explains almost in a mini cover letter, and Sarah's going to talk about cover letters a little later, what it's like to be her and why you would want to pick her. Then she has this cool um, quote on here. And she also has some information about herself, like her um, her strengths finder. And then she has her call to action, which says, I welcome connections from fellow NC State alumni that are building their career path. That lets people know if they should connect to her. So I wanted to point that one out. And then the next one I'm going to show you is Gabby. Now, the cool thing about Gabby, this Gabby, is what she did on her LinkedIn, and she got this position at, um, at SAS. So that is um, the job that she, I'm trying to remember if she got a job at SAS, actually got a, oh, actually, no, she got a job at Qualtrics. And what I wanted to show you on hers is when we go to see all activity, we have a chance to look at her articles. You want to be active on LinkedIn. You want to be posting interesting things. So here, Gabby posted an article. She basically did an internship, and then she said the 14, she did her internship at SAS. That's right. 14 things I learned being an intern at SAS. Now, when she posts this, people can comment on it. It shows that she is, and her tips are amazing, y'all. I could spend like three hours talking about get there early, network, et cetera. But you can always look her up on LinkedIn to read this article. And then we see all the comments that people made, 150 people viewed it. And those are the kinds of examples I think will help you with your LinkedIn is write your articles. You have your own opinions. Don't be shy to share it with the world and tag other people. And then the last one I wanna show you, cause I see our next guest has come. 
um, which is Jeff Sakharov. I'm so excited you're here, Jeff. Feel free to unmute and say hello really quick. <laughs> you caught me off guard. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> you're awesome. No, we're so happy you're here. Our next expert is waiting in the wings, but I wanted to show you Devon Waterman. Um, also chose to put pronouns on. I love that. Chose to put on some interesting things in the headliner here. And also on Devon, there is something great in his, and that is that he is constantly involved on LinkedIn. So he's putting examples of things he's done these are artifacts. This is evidence and proof that you should be qualified for your next role. And in this case, he did a podcast interview and we have a podcast called Wolfpack Career Chats. If um, one of our assistants can pop that link into the chat, you can listen to interviews and many of our students conduct the interviews. So that was kind of a feather in Devon's cap. He's got great evidence as you look at his LinkedIn profile. Here are real pictures and things that he has done. So I love showing you those examples, um, students, because one of the things that's wonderful on LinkedIn is these are the tips that differentiate you, that make you stand out. And that is personalizing your LinkedIn connection requests, having the eye-catching headliner, a summary with a call to action, evidence of your competencies to prove your worth, and then actively posting so you are seen as the expert. You can make an appointment with your career counselor in our office to screen share your LinkedIn over Zoom and get that critiqued and get feedback on how that will improve. And you'll meet many of those career counselors today. Courtney is actually one of those people. She works with our career identity program and coordinates all of the work for first year students that are making career choices. So a lot of people meet one-on-one -on -one with her to talk about career goals, career decisions. And right now we're doing that on Zoom. Uh, hopefully we're all going to be moving forward to face-to-face, um, -to -face, but wanting to stay as safe as possible this semester. So that will be done all online. And Courtney, if you're there, do you want to say anything about the Q&A at this point? Um, yes, uh, the Q&A is very, very active. So know that I am doing my best to get to um, as many questions as I can, but I will not be able to answer all of the questions. <laughs> Okay, Courtney is working hard and Grant and Sari might be also popping in with some answers to questions. Are there any that you want to announce right now, Courtney, before we move into our yoga break that we can answer out loud to everyone? I think one of the biggest ones that is most um, upvoted right now is that, you know, we have students who are not really confident in the amount of experience or the fact that they lack experience in the field that they're studying. Um, so they want to know how do they get started bolstering their resume to be relevant to their field, especially considering maybe that um, it's a smaller field. That's a great one, Courtney. What are your thoughts on that? I think that really the most important thing while you're a student at NC State is getting involved on campus. There are so many ways that you can um, join clubs or take specific courses that you can add those to your resume. And those are going to be things that, you know, when, like when I was a student at NC State back in the day, um, I did undergraduate research with a professor because I wanted to go to graduate school. So I knew that uh, research was going to be important for me to be able to go into my field. Um, but, you know, even something as simple as joining like a psychology club, since I was a psychology major, um, those are all things that you can start to add to your resume. And, you know, a lot of the questions that I'm getting, a lot of the answer is come in and talk to one of us. You have a career counselor in our office or in one of our satellite offices. And if you have these specific questions, we're going to be able to sit down with you um, or via Zoom sit down with you and help you create a plan that works for you because everybody is going to have a different interest area, a different plan. Um, and that is the best way to make sure that you know what you need to be doing to build your resume and to kind of have a plan um, for your time at NC State. Thank you, Courtney, for mentioning how active the Q&A is. I love it. Keep it coming, friends. This is fantastic. 
we can answer as many as we can today, but this is just the start. This is just the, you know, three hours of your day. You will be able to find out how to make your appointment with your career counselor. Courtney will share that a little bit later with the EPAC link popped in the chat. And this will be helpful to you to really customize those questions and get that tailored strategy by a coach who is trained with your college to help you get to your career goals. The other thing I saw in the chat had to do with letting people know that you are open to opportunities. And I'm going to do one more um, screen share on that one because I really liked that question. So what I've got now is I've got the work. And when we go to the top and we go to work, We've got here the opportunity to join groups, find leads. There's so many different things hidden in here. We can also go to the jobs tab here and we can see jobs that are recommended for us. And all of these are tabs that you will want to look at and enable so that you can decide exactly how to make sure that what you're doing is viewable by other people. So if I view my profile, I can go in and I can actually enable for recruiters to see me. So this was a really wonderful question. I always recommend if you aren't sure, and this sounds so obvious, just Google it. How to make recruiters know I'm available on LinkedIn. Um, all of those answers are, are there and people have had those questions before. And Grant, you may have also enabled that on your LinkedIn. Are you able to share your thoughts on how to make yourself viewable to recruiters? Yeah, like you said, um, make your profile say open to work. And I think one of the biggest things is just making your profile as unique to you as possible. Um, you know, social media is really good at, at helping people find you and think of LinkedIn in kind of the same way. Um, you're kind of branding yourself to other people. Um, and the more you add to your profile that's unique to you, the better chance recruiters have of finding you. So an example I give is in your headliner, put one of your unique skills because it sounds crazy, but a recruiter might just type in problem solver into their search bar. And if you have it in your headliner, your name and profile could pop up. Um, so just do your best to make your profile like super unique. Um, That's fantastic. I love that grant. And, um, and I know you as a senior, you have gone through many of these things. Um, so we really appreciate your thoughts on LinkedIn. All right, folks, I told you we were not going to just be sitting and listening on a two dimensional screen, we must move our bodies. I'm a wellness champion here at NC State. So one of the things, if you ever take my class, I teach the USC 401, which um, Grant has taken for seniors. Um, that class is full this spring, but the one that's open right now, um, Sari is teeing for, and she took, that's Career Exploration USC 202. So if you wanna grab a slot in that class, you can register on my PAC portal, Tuesday, Thursdays at three, shameless plug for that class. Um, it's fantastic. We break it down with yoga breaks throughout class because it is impossible to not move your body and just sit in front of a screen eight hours a day. All of us have been subjected to this with, uh, with working virtually. And let me tell you, Zoom fatigue is real. So we're gonna move now and I'm just gonna ask Sean, do I need to pick up another microphone or am I okay here? Okay, I'm gonna grab a microphone. It's on the, it's on the chair. All right, so I am now moving into the uh, yoga portion of our morning. So we are switching our camera angle. So what I'd like to do, I'm barefoot. That's the best way to practice yoga, friends. What I want you to do is just step away from your screen and you're welcome to um, look at me, to follow my voice for cues. But the idea now is to stand up if you are able, or you can do chair yoga if that's more comfortable for you. You don't need any props today. All we're gonna do today is just take a moment 
to be present together and to move our body. So just stand with your feet about hip distance, right under your sit bones. That's about two fists if you're not sure how far to put your feet out. And I want you to make sure your ribs are not popping. So kind of suck in your belly button just a little bit. And I want you to feel your feet rooted on the earth. Just imagine roots are growing into the ground below you and stand as tall as you can. And as you are standing tall, what I want you to do is just feel your body, notice any tension that you might have. And what we're going to do is interlace our fingers, which I realize I cannot do while I am holding the mic. So I'm going to demonstrate interlacing your fingers in front of you. And I want you to notice which thumb you put on top while we're standing. And you can follow me visually here. Now we're going to just bend to the right, hopefully y'all can still hear me because I can't hold the mic while I interlace my fingers. And just feel that side body release all the way down your left side. Maybe tilt your head, the crown of your head up to the sky and feel that lovely stretch. And hold that for two more breaths. And just come up to center. And then what we're going to do is bring our hands forward and switch the interlacing of our thumbs. So if you had your left on top now, switch it to your right on top. And we're going to, again, open up our chest and our back because we're hunched over the computer all day. And we're gonna lift straight up to the stars and feel the side stretch on our right. And again, feet rooted strongly into the earth, crown of your head tilting up forward. Just a lovely stretch there for our body, then up to the front. All right, also we have to do the kind of the pat your hands and um, rub your tummy, but this is a different one. We're going to move our arms. So one arm is going to go back like a windmill. And I'm going to see if I can do it. The other arm is going to go forward. Can you all do that? Just get that moving. Modify however you need. My left is going back. My right is going forward. That's super hard to do. And let's just do one balance for a second. Just on your left foot. Hold on to the wall if you want, if you're unsteady today. And just again, feel yourself rooted into the earth. Tense up your glutes, feel your hamstrings, your calves. Notice if anything is feeling tense today. And let's go ahead and do that on our other side. Just balancing, holding on to a friend if you have one there, a dog, and balancing and just being present for a moment. It's so important for us. And maybe do a couple neck rolls to end. Over to the right. And we're gonna do a couple neck rolls to our left. And let's just shake it out. So shake anything out. And we're gonna come back to our presentation. All right, so that was just a quick five minute interlude and it is now 1.40. Again, if you're doing the laundry, if you're walking the dog, feel free to just keep us there with the audio going. Today, I am next proud to introduce our next career expert. Like I said, I have assembled not only my best friends on campus, but uh, the most amazing career experts that exist at NC State University. Jeff Sakharov, please um, show us your lovely face if you're able, and welcome to um, today's boot camp. Thanks for being here. Well, hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, We're so I'm happy to have you, Jeff. And, and I wanted to just mention you are the Career Services Director over in College of Textiles on Centennial Campus. We're super jealous because you have a lovely facility over there. 
And your fun fact, I'm going to tell your fun fact, you are super in shape and you love soccer. <laughs> I, I think your information might be a little dated there, Marcy. I don't know that I'm in... <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate that. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Jeff. I know you you love sports like I do, especially soccer. So we have that in common. Is that still accurate? Uh, yeah, it's been a little while for me, but I do enjoy uh, playing casually when I get the opportunity for sure. And I, and I have to quote, I don't know if any of you follow English Premiership Soccer, but um, we're fanatics in my household and Manchester United, our team is now top of the table. So I have to state that today on January 13th because we're playing Liverpool next game. All right, Jeff, tell us about resume preparation. You've got some thoughts here. I do. And are, is my screen visible? I'm not sure. Yes. The, okay. It so looks you can great. See Before you begin Super. is what There we, we go. Super. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time just giving some um, highlights about resume preparation and things to keep in mind. But I, I like to begin the conversation um, kind of addressing some some challenges that I think students sometimes go into resume writing that they might not expect. And that first and foremost, you will find if you haven't already, resume writing is subjective and that you're going to get different opinions and different you know, levels of feedback about things you should do and not do in terms of objectives or format or layout. And it's not to say there's one way to do it. There is, you know, different opinions depending on the audience. And it can be a little maddening as you're trying to figure out what is the best way for me to write my resume. Um, and the truth is, there are variations. And so you might find that you have different layouts, different formats, try different things. Um, but the best advice I think is to, you know, show it to people you trust, people that, that know whether it's folks um, who work in the field like myself or the team in the CDC, um, or if you, you know, have connections to other people that are in recruiting or HR, or maybe been out for a little while. Um, but look to get feedback, but at the end of the day, it's your resume to, you know, that you have to be happy with and, and ultimately go with. So. Don't get too frustrated when you get differing opinions. It happens. Um, you know, find people you can trust, like the career center staff and so forth. That'll give you. The I best totally advice. agree with you, Jeff. I, I always find that that students will come to me and say, "Well, my professor said this, and my dad said this, and my internship supervisor said this," and it's like there's not a one size fits all. Right. Exactly. Um, and I know that can be frustrating and, and contradicting, but you know, the, the nature of it is it's a little freeing that you don't have to follow a certain template or certain format that you can have a little bit of creativity when it's appropriate, depending on the field, but your resume really shouldn't look exactly like every person, everyone else, you know, it shouldn't be identical to your roommates or, or other folks. It needs to be individualized. Um, the next thing I like to remind students that your resume, it's always a work in progress, that it's never done. Um, it's something you should come back to at least once a semester, in my opinion, updating it with you know your activities, organizations, experience as things change, as you move farther away from experiences that maybe you wanna leave off the resume. Um, but it's something that you should, and that carries on into your professional life. When you get out and working, your resume should always be up to date. You never know when things could change and an opportunity comes your way. It's easy to forget things if you don't update it regularly. Um, and this way you're, you're always prepared and poised should an opportunity um, present itself. So you're always gonna be working on it, sadly. <laughs> but not too disappointing for folks, but you're never gonna be done with your resume. It's totally never done. I always joke like if you sneeze, update your resume. But <laughs> you know, literally think about what you did over the break. Maybe you did something interesting like you learned something new pop it on your resume. It might be, someone was saying earlier, like, I don't have a lot of work experience. How do I start my resume? That question came in the chat. But you could take a skill from, let's say, a club that you were in. Maybe you were in a leadership role or from a class you took if you worked on a team. Keep that current, right, Jeff? Absolutely. And, and same goes for your GPA, which often can change every semester or, you know, there comes a point where high school things no longer need to appear on the resume. Uh, so just always being on top of it again, so that, you know, the worst is when you hear of an opportunity and maybe there's a deadline to apply and now your resume is not updated and there's a chance to miss out um, on, on a great opportunity because your resume wasn't, uh, you know, clearly updated the way you want it to be. All right, a couple other things to keep in mind. You know, I like to think of resumes, it's a marketing document. 
and like any commercial or any endeavor that tries to sell you something, um, there's some psychology that goes into it. And with any commercial you see, the advertiser is upselling or promoting the positive aspects of their product, their resource, whatever it is that is the it they're trying to sell. And they're, they're downplaying or negating anything that might not be a selling point. And so your resume is similar in that this needs to be marketing you and your best abilities, skill sets, um, and experience and you need to think about you're capturing the attention of the reader and that you know you are the product that you are, are so to speak trying to sell and so you want to make sure that everything on there is positive or reflective of your best abilities and and when i say you don't want to have anything on there negative you know that can be in the situation or, or, or instance if maybe your gpa isn't as high as you'd like it to be maybe you don't need to include it then if it's not a selling point. Doesn't mean you're being omissive or trying to be deceitful or that an employer still can't ask about it in the interview. But if it's not a selling point, it doesn't necessarily need to be front and center on the resume. Or Yeah, I totally agree, Jeff. You can, you can 100% customize it. Like your template is not gonna be someone else's and you shouldn't use a template. You should, you should make it your resume. And we're getting some awesome questions in the chat. Um, Jeff, do you mind if I, if I throw a few to you? Oh. Of course. Um, so one is about the length of the resume. Um, we have graduate students here today. We have undergrads and you work with employers and have critiqued so many resumes. What do you think about that? So I think the general kind of rule of thumb or consensus is for most undergraduates, a one page resume should be sufficient, meaning that you should be able to fit everything on one page. Um, and oftentimes, if, if you can't, it could be because you're spacing. Or there could be some extraneous information that maybe we, we don't need or, or experiences we can combine. Uh, so often that can be editing or formatting. But a good rule of thumb is if you're an undergrad, you really want to aim for a one page resume. Grad and or graduate and, and or master's and PhD students, there's a lot more flexibility there, you know, given you might have research or presentation experience or dissertations or, or teaching. So the resume or CV, depending on, on your target, naturally will be longer and employers come to expect that it it can yeah. be really challenging for a graduate student to try to get everything to one page and it ends up looking very crowded yeah um, i totally agree with you and some you know if you're in graduate school you're probably going to have a curriculum vita or a cv too which is for an academic audience and that can be multiple pages even if you're getting your phd um, but if you're going into industry keep it concise whether you're a grad student or an undergrad we also had a great question about listing volunteer work on your resume. What do you think about that, Jeff? So I, I think that's a really good question. And often we think about the experience on our resume as kind of in these buckets of work experience, um, or leadership or, or different categories. And sometimes we get locked into that. If your volunteer experience is significant um, and it's something that's important to you that that one you wanna to talk to an employer about in the interview, you want them to know about you. It, it shows your community service, your initiative, your connection to the, you know, the larger community. Um, I think there's a lot of benefits to including those types of things. How you prioritize them, though, can can differentiate from person to person. I don't know that volunteer experience would be, you know, if you think about your resume in terms of the most important things being near the top, volunteer experience might not be, you know, near the top of your resume. That might be something that comes a little bit later, um, assuming you might have some related experience that you want to showcase, you know, first and foremost to the employer. But I think yeah, it definitely it, can have a place. It, and it kind of depends, like you said, on the job you're applying for, because if you learn a certain thing in a volunteer role, it's just as relevant, right? You don't have to be paid for it. If it's in the job description, that's your rule book. Just don't forget, follow the rules of what this job is looking for, and you, you customize it each time. Someone also asked about the resume templates on Canva, um, because I said don't use a tem template. But I, I love your thought on that, Jeff, about using something that says, I see um, some of these resume templates on Canva. And um, let's see, that question just popped away, because new ones are coming in. But what do you think, Jeff? So I think it depends on the industry. The, the challenge with templates, um, I find, is that they often are restrictive and they lock you into a format that doesn't necessarily utilize spacing very well on the resume. It doesn't allow you the freedom to make edits that you, know, that you might normally do if you were just starting with a Word document. With that said, you know, if you're in a creative industry, like a lot of my students that go into fashion and textile design, they want to have a little bit more creativity on their resume to demonstrate their use of color or um, just creative, you know, a little punch here and there. So I think there can be a place, but, you know, if you're applying to something a little bit more traditional, um, whether it's in business or accounting or something where, you know, they really want to understand your experience and your skills and what you're bringing and not so much the 
how pretty it's going to look. You know, I, I think that you're probably safer going with a regular, you know, resume without any type of template. So I think if you're going into a creative field, there can be a place for that. Um, but again, yeah. there's a the downside it's, where you- You're right. It's so dependent on the audience. And that's why, like Courtney said earlier, make that resume critique appointment. You just need to log into EPAC and you'll find a time to meet up with your person who is assigned to your college because they're the experts. Jeff is such an expert on textiles. Coming up next, we have our expert um, from School of Design. I already see Kathleen is here waiting to have her conversation conversation. Um, Kathleen, if you're there, do you want to unmute and say anything about resumes um, for design students? She may. Um, we'll get to hear from Kathleen in a minute. Let's see. Because you are muted. Hi right. there, Marcy. I just um, went ahead and un unmuted myself. And I would say the same um, as Jeff that with design students, um, they might have a little bit more creative creativity with um, maybe a two column format or graphic design students might have something in their header that's like a logo. We still stay away from a lot of color on on our resumes, um, but a little bit of an accent color might be appropriate, like a more neutral blue in, in a header perhaps, but we still also stay away from too many elements that a hiring manager would have to interpret because it's one more time that if a company is using scanning software, it won't catch it because it can't read it. And it's one more time it takes additional um, energy or effort for the hiring manager to understand what you're trying to communicate. That's so important to hear from you, Kathleen. And I, I haven't introduced you yet because I saw you come early, but Kathleen Fenner is our amazing guest today, Director of Career and Academic Advising in the College of Design. Um, so we're so happy you popped into this conversation because it is so specific to these industries. If you're in engineering, we're gonna hear from Glenda, Daryl in just a few minutes, it's much more conservative and they're not gonna be looking for um, lots of bells and whistles. They're gonna be looking for competencies that match the job description. And then we had a question about GPA. I wonder, Jeff, what your thoughts are on cumulative. I know you addressed this a little bit or the minimum that you would put down and someone who's a master's degree student, should they even put it? Sure, that's a great question. And you know, we know that GPA has no correlation to career success. Um, and, and once you get through your first job, seldom if ever will anyone ever ask you about your college GPA. So um, hope I'm not giving the game away by telling you that, but you know, eventually your GPA will fall away from your resume regardless of what it is. But the general rule of thumb is typically, you know, if it's under a 3.0, you're gonna be you know, conventional wisdom says to leave it off and that you'd rather have that conversation with the employer if there's a story behind it, if you didn't do well, you know, for a semester or you transferred in or you're a different major or you just weren't ready for school and, and you've gotten stronger and learned how to study and manage your time over the past semesters and your GPs tracked up. There's always a story behind it. And so I think that's the important part. Um, you know, a GPA can be a data point for employers, depending on the industry, some will use it as a cutoff for students to apply. Um, which can be frustrating for sure. In that situation, you know, students can use major GPA rather than your, their overall. It's, you know, if you're going to do that, it's just imperative that you mention that on your resume. You don't just say GPA 3.8, you say major GPA 3.8 so that you are at least being as transparent as possible. Um, but again, you don't want to put anything on there that, that might tell the employer that either, you know, not that you're not a serious student, but that, you know, you, if you have a lower GPA, it's not going to set you apart in a positive way, right? If, if I have a GPA on a resume, and it's a 2.1 and everyone else's resumes are three point something and higher. You don't want to stand out for that reason. You'd be better served leaving it off and having the conversation should it come up. But that's the key. You have to be prepared if the employer asks about your GPA, what is the story behind it? And if it's not what you like it to be, what changes have you made? And, and what are you doing to, to 
get a, your hands around that. Yeah, 100%. This is the only time in your life anyone will ever ask you. I think Oprah recently said, you know, no one asks me my GPA anymore. Um, but it is, like you said, a little bit of a screening process in EPAC. We've mentioned that a couple of times. And some people have asked in the Q&A, how do I know who my counselor is? Just log into EPAC, just Google EPAC NC State. If you're um, in another window or Grant can pop in the link to EPAC directly. And that's where you can see to make the appointment with that person. So you don't need their email. You just actually log into EPAC. Um, we also had a question about um, this notion of how far back and what if you're a career changer? What do you think about that, Jeff? Career changers who have come back to college? Sure, so I think you know your experience needs to be the most important thing that the, res the employer sees in the resume. You don't have to be locked into what we call a reverse chronological resume. And what that means is, you know, traditionally you'd start with the most recent experience, what, what you're doing now or what you, maybe you did over the summer and start with that and then work your way backwards. But you know, really, I think your best serve on your resume is if you have the most important experience, most related experience, front and center and higher, closer to the top of the resume, even if it's not the most recent thing. In terms of how far you want to go back, you know, a, a kind of a good rule of thumb is, you know, when you're a first year student, it's expected that you're going to have some high school stuff on your resume, simply because that's been, you know, where you've spent most of your time. And if you've only been at NC State for a semester or two, you, you haven't done a lot yet to, to supplant that the the high school information. Ideally, by the time you're out of your first year, you're engaged on campus with organizations or leadership or volunteering, whatever that might look like, where the high school stuff can start to fall away. Yes. You know, is it horrible if you have something from high school on your resume? No, I don't know that it's going to be a deal breaker if you have, you know, Eagle Scout, for example, sometimes shows up on resumes for students that are close to graduation. I don't think that's a deal breaker for an employer. It, it, it shouldn't be the first thing they see. If it's a conversation piece, that's something you want to reference or something that's a connection or if it could, you know, somehow connect to the employer and what they do. You know, there, there's always those conversations about what's what's the intention of having this on your resume. Um, Such a good point, Jeff. And, and you know, this is um, this is one of the things that is often hard for students is to let go of things from high school. But we often say, you know, if it's your first year here, we've kind of wiped high school clean because we know you did a great job. And now you get to build it up again by getting involved, like Courtney said earlier, in things on campus and taking part in leadership. There's so many virtual opportunities. Um, Grant, you might be able to pop in the chat just the link to student involvement so that students can look and see how they can get um, a leadership certificate or how they can get involved involved in a club that relates to what they want to study in the future. And, um, and, and Jeff, keep going. You have some great bullet points. Well, there. I know I, I don't want to go over. So I just, uh, I'm going to put those up there and I can just touch on a couple of these things, but you know, your resume has one job to do, and that is to get you an interview. No, no one is ever going to look at your resume that you send them and say, you're hired. When can you start? It's always the first step. So, you know, you need to think about it going back to that marketing document. It needs to be interesting enough to the employer that they say, huh, Marcy looks pretty interesting. Let's call her for an interview. And that's all it needs to do is just get you in front of that employer. And so, you know, it's important to remember that it, it's a highlight reel. This is not your life story. So going back to that question about high school, you need to think about your resume as a highlight reel. This is just the most important things the employer needs to know when you get into the interview is when you're able to expand or talk about some of these things. And to that point, if you end up having to cut something off the resume because of space, it doesn't mean you can't still talk about it in the interview or make that part of the conversation. It just means it didn't make that that highlight cut, if that makes sense. So sometimes framing it that way can be helpful when you're trying to decide what do I keep, what do I let go of, of especially with high school things. Um, so keep that in mind. Yeah, 100%. And I love how you finalize this with no room for error. I once um, was on a search committee and I was reading a cover letter, which we'll talk about a little later. And it said, I am very impressed with the strong repetition of NC State University. Okay, we all know what they meant to say was reputation. But if you didn't even take the time to proofread it, what kind of a worker will you be, right, Jeff? Yep. And, and similar, I've seen so many cover letters when I worked at UNC where it would be, um, you know, either NC State University Chapel Hill, or when I worked here, it'll say UNC Raleigh, like people get the school wrong. And if that's the first sentence of the cover letter, you hate to say that's the reason someone doesn't get hired, because I'm sure there are many quality candidates that, 
you know, save for a typing error would have gotten a job, but that's the reality of what we're dealing with. And so, you know, I can't stress enough of getting it, you know, getting your resume proofread, as Marcy mentioned, schedule an appointment with a counselor, um, get someone to look at it because we all had the experience of you read the same document you've written 20 times and then you show it to someone else and they find a glaring typo or something that you just didn't see. And so it's- yes. hard. Yeah, you're like, hard. I looked at it so much and you just, you're blind. You're like, oh my gosh, I spelled my email wrong. Right. Um, Jeff, I know you've got a two o'clock meeting and we've had so many great questions for you. We're so grateful that you're here. Anything you want to end with? I just, I'm so glad you all are taking advantage of this program. Um, it's wonderful to see the numbers and yeah, take advantage of the resources that are available. We are all here to help you. We all are passionate about what we do. Hopefully you can tell that by now. Um, and so just keep on keeping on. There's a lot of unknowns in the world right now, but we can control this part. You can control the actions and steps you're taking to be the best, most equipped job seeker you can be. So kudos to you. And uh, yeah, thanks for including me. Hope the rest of the oh, day goes well. It's great to see you, Jeff. I'm missing you, you on campus. I miss giving <laughs> y'all hugs, all these things. Um, but Jeff, I know you got to run. Make sure you don't end the meeting for all. Just um, yes. leave the meeting. <laughs> we had that happen at New Student Orientation, y'all. I'm, I'm like, I said, what technical problem will happen today. One of my panelists will like end the meeting for all, um, but hopefully not. Thanks, Jeff. You have a my great pleasure. Afternoon. You too, guys. Take care. Um, and these tips are so awesome. I mean, you, you students, you do not know the experts that you are sitting under the heels of today. I'm literally telling you all of these questions you're asking are amazing. Keep them coming. Um, Courtney, do you want to mention any other questions that have popped up that you would like to address live or would like me to? Sure. Uh, once again, a lot of these questions are very specific to um, individuals, and I'm doing my best to get you um, some generic answers, but a lot of the answers, once again, are going to be to meet with your career counselor. I think that, you know, you all have some really great experience. Um, some of you have um, balanced parenting with being a student. Some of you have uh, made career switches, and I think that it is always best to have someone sit down, understand your story, and help you to be strategic about how you can I don't want to say sell your story, but how to best present yourself to an employer, because I do think that some of the strongest candidates that I see are candidates who have faced adversity and overcome that and balance those things. So um, definitely go to EPAC um, on our website to set up your account and meet with your um, career counselors, because we're really cool people in general. Um, and one of the other ones that I saw that I think is really cool, um, that I think is an important one is, um, someone asked, is there a way to tell employers that I would rather be contacted by email often can't answer their phone, um, but they don't want to miss out on an opportunity. I would not tell them this. What I would do is have your voicemail set up to be super professional. And then you can always either call them back at a time that you can speak with them on the phone, or you can send them an email. Generally speaking, when you are um, applying for positions, you need to play by their rules of engagement because they currently kind of have the bargaining power. So generally speaking, I would recommend for you to um, just have your voicemail set up and be ready to reply and be responsive. I completely agree, Courtney. Your, your opinions are so important for students to hear. And these questions are amazing. Keep them coming. And like I said, this is just the start today. If your question doesn't get answered, now you know the resources. Grant has posted the EPAC link. You can open a separate window now and find your person if you're in sciences or if you're in CALS or if you're in humanities. All of these people are listed. And you can just pop. All you have to do is open your Zoom link and you get this one-on-one -on -one conversation, which is so fantastic. I saw one question in the chat that I want to address too. It was a computer science major said, can I put hyperlinks in my resume? What I would recommend is that you use your LinkedIn for your hyperlinks. That's that example I showed you with Devon Waterman and you can type his name in LinkedIn and look at his profile if you joined late. He actually had evidence on his LinkedIn of all of his competencies. Now, like we said earlier, when we were talking with Anna Valesia from the Alumni Society, people who are hiring managers are going to Google you. The first thing they are going to see is your LinkedIn profile. And this is where, if they want to know more about you, they have the opportunity to see that evidence of your skills. So computer science major, 
humanities and social sciences, that's where you should be putting all of your proof. It could be a PowerPoint you designed. It could be an Excel spreadsheet that you were involved in analyzing. All of those examples are great. Um, it could be a podcast interview you did. Um, I know Grant, you did a podcast interview in my class and you posted that up on your LinkedIn, right? I think so, yeah. It's definitely something I wanna feature too on people who look at my profile. Yeah, and Grant's an economics major. He's not gonna be a podcast editor, but it definitely shows that he is doing things that are transferable to any industry. Employers have told us the top career competencies that they are seeking in college graduates. They have told us what they are. And I actually have a YouTube on that. Um, Grant or Sari might be able to just go to my YouTube channel and um, find the link to that video, which is called Career Readiness 2.0 and pop that in the chat because I go through in that 10 minute YouTube and tell you all of the career competencies that employers want. It's not a mystery. It's things like teamwork. You're gonna hear about it from some alumni in just a moment. It's things like leadership, things like cultural awareness. And these are the things you want to prove on your resume. If you're early here at NC State, let's say it's your first or second semester, you have time to plan what you want your resume to look like by that last semester. And when you view the competencies, then you have a chance to say, well, what can I do to get that competency? Let's say I need technical skills. How can I gain that? What class can I take? What activity can I participate in? What internship can I do? So all of those are examples of how you would demonstrate that on your resume to prove that you have that competency. And like, like I said with Grant, communication skills is needed in every single major from economics to political science. If he did a podcast interview and he posts it up there an employer sees it, they're like, wow, this guy can carry on a conversation. This guy's pretty articulate. This guy's actually really smart. So you want to post those links onto your LinkedIn. And that's a really great recommendation. All right, so we have a new guest. Um, let's stretch. We got we got three more minutes to stretch. So last time we did our, um, our left and right thumb on top in the front. This time, what I want you to do is behind you, okay? So I'll face you so you can hear me. But I want you to do your stretch behind you because you're all hunched over a screen way too much. And I want you to just puff out your chest by clasping your fingers behind you. And if you can even stretch out more, if your flexibility allows you, just go ahead and stretch out all the way. Might be coming out of the screen now. <laughs> I'll let you see my body. Okay, so just go ahead and stretch all the way out here. And we're just blanking out our screen so you can see me, okay? Just feel that length and then go ahead and let's just do a forward fold. Again, feet hip width, width distance, about two fists, and just shake it out. Shake it out in a forward fold. Maybe bend your left leg, bend your right leg. Feel your calves, your hamstrings. Feel your feet rooted in the ground. And it's really important for us every hour that we're online to move our bodies. Let's just put our hand on our heart for a minute and let's just feel our breath together. We have this community breath that we're doing together. Over 500 of us are present at this moment. We have created this amazing community. We are starting 2021 with so much optimism to reach our goals. Just feel your lungs filling up. Take the biggest, deepest breath and suck in two more pieces of air. And then just slowly breathe out anything that is not serving you today. Any negative thoughts that are in your mind about your ability to reach your goals. You are here, you are moving forward. And like Jeff said, you have this amazing support system here to lift you up. If you start falling y'all, we got your back and we're gonna catch you in the Career Development Center. 
Next up is Sarah Wild. Welcome, Sarah. I saw you just joined us from Raleigh, North Carolina, from your beautiful home. I don't know if I will get to see your dogs today, but Sarah has two beautiful dogs, uh, and we always love when they join the Zoom calls. And Sarah is your career counselor for the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. She's been with us almost five years, comes um, with amazing experience from some other universities. Uh, one of my favorite people and super smart and has some great tips on cover letters and her fun fact, and this is so impressive, Sarah, you bought your first house at age 30, 100% by yourself, and you closed on it the same day you were doing a professional presentation. That's amazing. So proud of you. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks, Marcy. I appreciate it. I wish I could share with the group uh, some video of my two pups, but today I'm actually in my office. So I'm excited to be with you all. I will go ahead and share my screen. Yeah, please feel free to share your screen. And the big question that we've all been waiting for, drum roll, are cover letters dead? Please tell me they are, they take so long and I don't have time to write them, Sarah. What do I do? <laughs> Great question. So for those of you that maybe haven't applied to an internship or a job yet, typically an employer will have you fill out an application, submit a resume, and sometimes they will ask for a cover letter. So a cover letter is a professional letter that allows you to make a personal connection with this employer. So we're going to talk a little bit about this today. One thing that's unique about cover letters is they are tailored to the job description in which you're applying to. So each time you write a cover letter, it will be a little bit different. So the big question is, are cover letters dead? And I say, I, I say, heck no, I think they're alive and well, my friends. Um, I'm glad you said that, Sarah, because if you said they were dead, I would be like, dang, we don't agree on that. <laughs> <laughs> I say, heck no. Yes, they are a little time consuming um, because you have to tailor them and critique them and edit them, um, but certainly valuable. And I'll tell you a little bit regarding why I think that. So why? Why are they not dead? What's the point of writing a cover letter? So for two reasons. Cover letters are just one more opportunity for you to sell yourself to a hiring manager, to a hiring team. So yes, you have your application, you have your resume, but then you have this extra document to tell them more about yourself and why you'd be a great fit for that company in that job. So you want every chance that you can get, especially in the market that we're in right now, where it's so competitive, to really share why you'd be the perfect candidate. The other reason, reason number two, truly dedicated candidates, applicants who really want this internship, this co-op, this full-time job, they're going to take the time to make sure that they submit all of their materials, including a cover letter. You're in competition here with other students, recent graduates, even individuals that might already have work experience. So this is a competition that you wanna win, especially if it's a position that you're really excited about. So now sometimes employers will say a cover letter is optional. If that's the case, I would definitely still recommend that you submit a cover letter. So for those of you who haven't seen a cover letter before, I did wanna provide um, an example format of what it looks like just really quickly. So at the top, you'll have your contact information, the date, the organization's name, and if you have the hiring manager's name and title, you'll have a greeting at the top, and then it will be three to four short paragraphs. A cover letter is no more than one page typically. You'll have an intro, um, one to two body paragraphs, and then you'll have a closing. At the bottom of a professional business letter, like a cover letter, you'll write sincerely um, your first and last name signed. You can use a script font or you can sign your name and scan it in, um, and then your name typed at the bottom. So this is what a for, for the format of a cover letter would look like. So we're going to talk a little bit about strategies for success next. 
So these are just some key tips to really keep in mind when you're writing your first cover letter. All right, first things first, you have to format your document as a professional business letter. So keep in mind what we just saw on the last screen. One thing that I sometimes see on cover letters is that as a student, we're used to indenting our paragraphs in the papers that we write in class. We won't do that in a cover letter. Um, so pay close attention to how you format your document. The next thing is your font style and size, maybe even your margins should match your resume. So it looks like they're a pair that they go together because they do. So when an employer sits down and looks at your document, it looks professional, it's easy to read, it matches the resume that you've submitted. So you're, we're looking at the whole package here. This middle section at the top is really, really important. The purpose of the cover letter is to highlight one or two experiences that you've had and skills that you've developed that relate to the internship, co-op, or job that you're applying to. So for instance, if you take a look at your resume, you might talk a little bit about some academic classes that you've participated in and the skills you learned in that class. Or maybe you participated in a study abroad and you developed certain skills that would relate to an internship you're applying to. Or your involvement in a student organization where you served as a chairperson, or maybe you had a part-time job or internship that would relate to a full-time position that you're applying to. So that is like the meat of a cover letter. So the next piece is, I know Marcy mentioned this before, proofreading. Proofreading, 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 and that means for spelling, grammar and punctuation. So not only can your career counselor review your cover letter and talk you through potential changes, um, edits, et cetera, but this is something we also need you to do first. Um, there is absolutely no room for any mix up, mess ups on your cover letter. I'll tell you the first time I applied for a job out of graduate school, I wrote the wrong employer's name on my cover letter. <laughs> I had to call the university HR department and, and let them know I accidentally made a mistake. And fortunately, I was able to re-upload my document. That will not always be the case. So triple check it. Even if you need to read it through one day and go back the next day, sometimes your brain needs that break. The last piece that I think is really important that we'll talk about just a little bit more is a cover letter, yes, has a certain format. Yes, there's certain content, but we want to engage the person who's reading this cover letter. It's about telling a story and evoking emotion so that you're memorable. This is not just a repeat of your resume where you're writing almost exactly what you wrote in your bullet points on your resume. So, I'll give an example of this, which I got from Courtney because it was a perfect example. Thank you so much, Courtney. So instead of saying in your cover letter in a body paragraph, while at NC State, I was a research assistant in the XYZ lab where I used ABC equipment. This is well written. It says, you know, your research position. It says equipment you used but it's, it's pretty, a pretty basic sentence. And we really want to tell, tell more of a story, paint a picture. So let's look at this second example. Instead, we might try this. At NC State, while using ABC equipment in the XYZ lab, I had a strange test result come back suggesting a genetic mutation that I reported to our lead researcher. This resulted in an ongoing partnership with the lab. I also gained knowledge of this, this, and this, etc. So you see there's like a little bit different in, difference in how you word what you're saying to really engage the reader in a different way. Now, punctuation, spelling, etc. There's, of course, lots of resources online that can help you do this well. But if you're struggling with the creative writing component, I would definitely encourage you to come in and talk with your career counselor, because this is certainly something that we can help you with. 
And then the last piece of information that I want to share with you all, because I want to make sure we have a little time for questions if we do, is you have resources at your fingertips. So if you visit our website, at the top, there is a tab called Gain Experience, where you can access our 2020-2021 Career Guide, which is a fantastic resource. Um, and in here, you'll actually be able to see um, how to format your cover letter, what content you should include, and there's actually a sample cover letter in the guide. So if you're feeling a little lost, or you're not sure where to start, you can view this right online in the career guide. So we have your back, we're here to support you. We wanna help review your cover letters that you write so you feel comfortable and confident um, to land that interview. Um, but these are great resources to start with. So thanks so much for listening. Do we have questions that I might be able to answer? Amazing, Sarah. And thank you for showing this link. Um, Sari, if you can pop that in the um, chat for everyone, the link to the career guide on the Career Development Center webpage. Like Sarah said, it's a 50 page Bible of everything you need to know, not just cover letters, but it's got the resume tips. It's got the LinkedIn tips. It's, um, it's really all of our best stuff in written form. And we are open folks. So if you happen to be on campus, you can physically walk in to Poland Hall. We have plexiglass, we have masks, we have social distancing, and you can also ask questions there. But a lot of the work we're doing is remote. So Sarah, we did get some really great questions and I loved everything you said today. You're such, you're such a star. Uh, that PowerPoint was amazing. And that's why I invited you to talk about this because I remember reading your cover letter five years ago. And uh, I think you might've been living in New York. I can't remember, but, um, or were you living in the Midwest then? I was in Indiana, Indianapolis, Indiana then. Okay, and, and Sarah was, um, she stood out from everyone. There were hundreds of people that applied for her role. But her cover letter, I saved it, students, and I literally showed it in my class for the next couple of years because she, like she said about customizing it, she customized it so much. She actually went to the above and beyond to find out who the director of our office was. It wasn't posted anywhere, but she was able to research that. You could say, dear members of the search committee. And then she took every single thing we wanted and gave a specific example of how she had that. She also talked about why she wanted to move to North Carolina, which to me was interesting because I was like, oh, she's in Indiana. She just applying everywhere. So I really love that, Sarah, what you put. And there was a question on the, um, the Q&A, and I know Courtney is working feverishly to try and answer these questions. But one question was, um, do recruiters read entire cover letters? And if so, like what percentage? What do you think? So whenever I have participated in recruiter panels where recruiters talk a little bit about their hiring practices, it's really split across the board. Um, it can be really helpful to review a cover letter because if something might be unclear on a resume, the recruiter is definitely going to go to your cover letter to try and learn more. Um, but what I think is really important too is some of these recruiters and companies that are large in size will use applicant tracking systems to scan your resume and your cover letter for keywords. And if you don't have enough of those keywords in your resume, I hope they would come out in your cover letter. Um, so no matter what, I would highly recommend um, having a cover letter along with your resume, um, even if it says it's optional. Yeah, exactly. Because you, I mean, hundreds of people applying, you want to be that person that did everything. You don't want to be that person that did the minimum. And we talked earlier about following up. Yes, follow up, check back, be persistent. All of that shows the kind of standout employee that you will be. We all know it's a global pandemic. Let's just address the fact that the economy has had a downturn. But there are jobs. We have had thousands of students interview during our career fair. And Kathleen Fenner is going to talk about that in a few minutes, virtual career fairs. We have had hundreds of companies come to our career fairs. They are hiring. We also did a podcast with Lindsay Pollack. And I'm going to ask um, Grant to pop that in the chat, the link to it. She is a New York Times bestselling author. And her podcast interview was what 
can a college student do during a global pandemic to find their next career option, internship, job, co-op? It is a 30 minute must pop in your earbuds and listen to the next time you're out on a walk. And I think this afternoon, it's gonna be beautiful. So listen to that link. I, I see that that is gonna be popped in the chat here by one of our TAs any minute now. They are scurrying around to find all of these links as I mention them. And I want you to subscribe to Wolfpack Career Chats because every week we have updated content. We're interviewing alumni, it's inspirational, and we're giving you some specific tips. We have um, one of our chats is on the five questions you ask at the end of the interview. Um, that's a link that you can also listen to and it's only 10 minutes long. And as you know, we also have YouTube. So, so many follow-up resources for you. Sarah, this has been a wonderful conversation. Courtney, I see you unmuted your, your camera. Do you have any other questions? We have time for one more. Yes, I actually have one question that I did want to address um, live. So we have a question that's basically asking about how seriously should we take job qualifications. Um, a lot of jobs say they want a certain number of years of experience and, you know, so this particular person says um, they want to apply to jobs that require four to five years of experience and they only count the PhD program that they're in as three years should they apply anyway and my answer is yes. The reason I say yes and this goes for undergrads, grad students, everyone. Um, employers are looking for unicorns. And if you are a very nice horse, you can glue a traffic cone to your head and become a unicorn. If you have the majority of the qualifications that someone is looking for, I always recommend you apply. If you feel that you are qualified and can do that job, apply. And the reason I say this is never tell yourself no. Let them tell you no. If they don't want to interview you, they won't. But don't tell yourself no and count yourself out of an opportunity just because you may not meet 100% of the qualifications. Generally speaking, most applicants don't meet 100% of the qualifications. So just know how to best sell your qualifications, which of course we can help with, um, but that's a big thing that I get asked a lot that I wanted to make sure to share. That's a wonderful way for us to wrap up cover letters. Thank you so much for being here, Sarah. You're welcome to hang out with us. Have a lovely day in Poland Hall. I see you there with your door closed. And when you walk out, you'll have your mask on. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Bye, everyone. Uh, bye. And um, please don't end the meeting for all, Sarah. Please don't do that. Okay. Everyone's doing so good. My panelists are super smart. They read my emails. Just kidding. A lot of people don't read my emails, but you guys are on my email list. You're going to be hearing more. Like, let's just say you don't have Apple AirPod Pros. I'm giving them away at CareerCon. Yes, Wolfpack fans, you are the first to hear this. And if Grant and Siri can pop in the link to CareerCon, how to register, or Courtney can pop that in right now. I know when you join Zoom, the chat is erased from the earlier part. So everybody needs to know how to register for CareerCon. February 21st, giving away Apple AirPod Pros. And we're not giving away anything today, but we're giving away so much good information. Uh, so just wanted you to know that that event is going to be 50 alumni coming back to campus on a Sunday afternoon, even better than this, and it will build on this. So uh, let's just say we're going to go to um, some alumni now, speaking of which. So I am going to uh, do another screen share here. And I am going to um, go to a video that is of four alumni. Now, this video is going to give you wonderful tips on virtual interviewing. We just recorded it yesterday, although they could not physically be live with us today, but they do invite you to connect with them on LinkedIn. So if you're super savvy Wolfpack fans, you'll write their name down when it pops up on the YouTube. This is a private YouTube that no one else gets to see except y'all. So here it comes. And I am about to share it right now. The sound should be working. Uh, please tell me if the sound is not working. Here we go with your pens and pencil ready to write down all of these great tips. 
My name is Tim Cabral. I am an actuary at Oscar Health, and I'm very excited to be here today to share my tips and tricks on virtual interviewing. Um, my first tip is actually to treat a virtual interview just as you would an in-person interview. Um, it is very easy uh, to uh, start fumbling around with all your notes, right? You can have all of your notes around you, a separate laptop up if you, if, if you want, but that kind of makes you be disengaged from the conversation and interviewers will really be able to pick up on that. Um, you really just want to be your true self um, and treat it like a normal conversation. My second tip is to be a clear and concise communicator, right? Interviewing is where you're able to differentiate yourself from the other candidates. At first, prior to the interview, uh, the interviewer will have your resume, which really just gives that surface level, are you qualified for this role? And really what's gonna set you apart in the interview is whether you can communicate, whether you can dive into the details on your resume um, and differentiate your, yourselves from other candidates. And lastly, uh, my third uh, tip is, which I really think is underappreciated, is to show a genuine passion and interest for the role and company, right? In every single interview, you will be asked something along the lines of, why are you interested in this role? Why are you interested in this company? And that's a good time to really uh, show your, your passion for the role, why you're interested in the role. Another way to, to bring across this, this interest is when you have the ability to ask questions, right? You always want to come prepared to an interview with a lot of questions. Um, if the interviewer doesn't give you time at the end to ask questions, then just say, hey, I would love to, to ask some follow-up questions. May I get your email um, so I can reach out again? My name is Sean Clem. I'm a Wolfpack alum. I work at a software company called Topalti. And I'll be providing you with some kind of practical things that you can do in addition to, uh, to what Tim said. So I think two of the things that he focused on uh, around clear and concise communication and then showing an interest in the job uh, are, are two of the most important things. So being able to come up with really good examples of, of things you've done and taking time to think about what those are. I think that the most important thing and the thing that resonates most with hiring managers is that you've done your research. Um, both in terms of your own experience, as well as the questions you'll ask for, uh, of employers. Um, so going the extra mile, looking on things like LinkedIn, looking on things like Crunchbase, reading the news and understanding what it is that you're going to be doing is really, really important as part of that interview process. Um, I think what stands out in, in a really good candidate versus just an average candidate or maybe below average candidate is the way that they approach that. So I typically, as someone who interviews people via Zoom and in person, is uh, I typically leave a lot of time for people to ask questions. And when people aren't prepared with questions, that's usually a red flag for me. So even if you don't get a chance to answer them like Tim mentioned, or get them answered like Tim mentioned, um, having those thought out and, and taking the time and doing the research to do that is really important. Um, and then, as he mentioned with effective communication, making sure you're able to sort of synthesize and provide concrete examples um, of the questions asked. So it's, it's really useful um, to actually have evidence of, of when you've done something. Um, so speaking less in generalities and more specifics and, and really relating back to that point. And then once you've answered the question, kind of relaying that back and saying, this was a time when you performed X. Um, so those are two kind of practical tips that you can use in, in, in addition to, uh, to what Tim provided there. Thanks everyone, go pack. Wonderful tips. Tim and Sean, it's great to hear different employers' viewpoints from different industries. And some basic things too, don't forget your lighting, make sure you're not backlit, make sure you're looking at the camera, you're not going to get interrupted. We're going to transition now to two young alumni who are going to talk about once you get the offer and you start the job, how you can be successful and really stand out as a young professional. Hi everyone, my name is Kaylin Bullock. I graduated in 2016 and I currently work at the Department of Justice. I am excited to give you all my three tips of being a successful new professional. 
Um, so my first tip is to ask questions, be curious, and do not be afraid of making mistakes. Um, I found that when I started out, the more questions I asked, the more things I got involved in, the more curious I was, the more successful I was because I was um, always getting thrown into the new task, learning more, and the more I learned, the better I felt in my role. Um, and as someone who's worked for four years now, I feel like I love working with those people because I feel like they can be thrown into any situation and they figure it out and they're curious and they're always looking to learn. So my second piece of feedback is um, actually related to feedback. So being able to take feedback criticism um, is something super important, particularly in your first job. It's not something that we're all comfortable with. Um, you know, I, when I had my first performance review, understanding what I was doing well was great. I felt awesome. I was on a roll, but then also knowing what I didn't do great was kind of hard to hear, but being able to take that as um, a professional, understand what you can do to grow is one of the best things because that's just gonna make you a better professional and gonna make you um, more successful at your job. So understanding that, taking that and not being offended by it, just using it as a way to grow is something really important. And my last thing is take mental notes along the journey of what you like and what you don't like, because though you are also trying to prove yourself in your new role, you're also trying to understand what you like and what you wanna do next and where you wanna go. Um, taking notes of what you like in a manager, because you're probably gonna be a manager one day. Um, taking notes of how you like to work, what your work style is, what your coworkers are. All of those are gonna be important things to understand um, where you wanna go next in your journey. So good luck and go pack. Hi, Wolfpack. Um, my name is Shelby Clem. I am an alumni that graduated in 2012. I am currently a user experience researcher at Google, and I'm excited to be here sharing a couple of tips with you guys today. Um, what I wanted to share today was a few tips related to how I found success early in my career and really how it still helps propel me forward today. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to share with you guys is teamwork. And this should be something that's pretty obvious, but just wanted to reiterate it here today. Being able to comfortably work in a team, to flex to different people that you're working with, and to really feel like you can be part of a team is incredibly important in the work environment. I know that for me growing up playing soccer, that really helped me as I moved into the professional world to feel like I was part of a big group and I was working towards something. The next thing that I think is incredibly important is being able to understand when you should lead and when you should follow. Everyone loves to be the leader of something. Everyone loves to lead a team towards a goal. And it's a great feeling to have, but it's incredibly important to kind of understand when there's someone else that's taking that point position and where you fit into that group. So being able to take a step back and say, you know, I have this role it may not be the front and center person. It may not be the person that gets to present this to the executive. And I'm actually crunching the numbers that are feeding that presentation. And that's just as pivotal of a role to play as well. And last thing that I think is incredibly important early into the career and as you continue into your career is flexibility. And this can go across so many different layers. This could mean being flexible to the type of work that you're doing. When you're starting off, you may not be doing exactly what you studied or exactly what you're passionate about, but being able to say, I'm going to take one for the team, I'm going to step up and I'm going to do this well and be flexible because I know that eventually that's going to get me to that point is a really great trait to have. It also might mean being flexible in terms of lifestyle. I know for me, I took a job where I was traveling um, almost every week and it wasn't something that I had seen myself doing but it was something that propelled my career in a positive direction. And having that flexibility and that ability to mold to different situations uh, proved to be really helpful for me as I was moving forward. So um, thanks again, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and um, good luck to you all, go Pack. Love that video and love those people. So next up, we are going to be moving into virtual career fairs. And I would like to, um, let's see, am I at the right time? Yes, I am. I am one minute ahead, y'all. I just want to say, boom, I'm killing it. So Kathleen Fenner, welcome back. Um, we had you jump in earlier as our Director of Career and Academic Advising in the College of Design, um, also Secretary of the Professional Association, North Carolina Association of Colleges 
coaches and employers. Kathleen is amazing. She knows so much. She's planning a virtual career fair. Kathleen, how are you today? Great. Thanks so much for having me. I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen so that you can see my PowerPoint. And we're going to be talking about making the most of virtual career fairs. So let me go ahead and go to my slideshow to get this started. And virtual career fairs are new for all of us. And we're all thinking they're going to stay because no one has to wait in line and have a problem parking, right, Kathleen? Absolutely. There's some nice perks about virtual career fairs. And we want to talk about uh, navigating your steps for success today to make the most of them. And so we'll focus on the phases before, during, and after. So as you are preparing your materials, we've already talked a little bit about uh, updating your resume and reviewing that with a career counselor or a career coach. I'd also encourage you to look over the Career Development Center's tutorials. And I put in the link that you can see that they have some great information and how to's. It's a great time to download the Career Fair Plus app or to take a look at it on your browser. Um, so uh, take a look at that icon that I have listed so you know the visual of what you're looking for. And right now you can start researching the virtual career fairs that are being offered for the spring. Um, remember that additional career fairs are going to be added um, on the website. So you'll wanna come back to that. So when we think about what does researching employers to create a targeted list mean, uh, we wanna identify what's the industry of this employer? What's their mission? What type of product do they produce or service do they provide? Read their job descriptions or their internship descriptions. So they connect how your interests, experience, skills, and strengths connect to this specific employer and role to help inform the conversation that you'll have. You can browse through the employers at the different virtual career fairs before you create your profile. And we'd encourage you to look at all of the virtual career fairs um, to see the variety of employers. So maybe you're in CHAS, but you see that another college has a virtual career fair that's open to you and there's a particular employer of interest, go ahead and participate in that event as well. So you can create your profile and um, when you do so, you'll need to have a resume that you're including. So you will have a chance to swap out a new resume if you need to later on. But one important thing to note is that the phone number that you have on that uh, resume, if all of the technology fails on the day of the event, the employer um, will have your resume from you signing up for an appointment with them. And so they'll be able to rely on that phone number. But we've had a great experience with the students enjoying using Career Fair Plus um, and the employers that have been utilizing it too. As you create that profile and sign up for an appointment with the employer at the fair that, that you're interested in, take a look to see what the time length is of that appointment. So many of the appointment times will be 10 minutes for the design career fair. Um, I'm encouraging the employers to have 15 minutes to be able to talk a bit longer. But some events have had appointment slots as, as uh, short as five minutes. The amount of information you can share about yourself or the numbers, number of questions that you can ask really depends on um, how long you'll have to talk with them. And it gives you a, a chance to think about how you'll plan out what you want to communicate to them. So go into that appointment to have a conversation uh, to introduce yourself. And we're gonna talk about how to introduce yourself in just a minute. So let's talk for a second, just a deeper dive in what does it mean to research the employers that are coming to the virtual career fairs. You can use a, a wide variety of methods, the Career Fair Plus app, EPAC, looking at going global. You can look at the company's direct websites and social media accounts. A lot of times companies, uh, recruiters and hiring managers, 
post a, a lot of information about their jobs, their internships, and what makes a great candidate, uh, describing their mission and their goal that will help inform your conversation in their social media channels too. And also do a quick Google search of, of that employer. Uh, for example, uh, the Raleigh-Durham Chapel here is a fantastic area that has a headquarters for a lot of companies. So maybe a company is, is moving their headquarters to North Carolina, or they're adding 300 new jobs in the next year. Those are exciting developments for that employer that would, you know, that if you discuss with them, it shows that you have an understanding of, of their organization. So before you actually get to the virtual career fair appointment, let's make sure to practice our introduction of ourselves. You've often heard that called an elevator pitch, perhaps. And so in this elevator pitch, uh, if we have 10 minutes or so to introduce ourselves, we want to give them the most pertinent information, um, branding ourselves, helping them understand our education. What's your degree level? Are you an undergraduate, a master's, or a doctoral student? What's your program and when will you graduate? We want to talk about our strengths and our skills and we can think about how would we spend the bulk of our time in, in completing the responsibilities that we would have in a job or internship with this company to line those up to show how we add value. We can talk about our relevant experience, which might be um, from working, from internships or volunteering. Um, we could even talk about uh, noteworthy leadership, whether it was through a student organization or a community organization, and having a really strong hook where we're connecting our career goal to the organization and that type of role we would have to show how we add value is really strong. It's also a good time um, as we're practicing this elevator pitch to pick out an outfit. And we'd recommend, you, you've heard to, from, from those alumni, to wear a similar outfit that you would wear to an in-person event. And so sometimes we have issues with technology or maybe that roommate that we have keeps knocking on the door even though we let them know we have an appointment and, and we need quiet. And so you might have to get up. So we want to dress from our head to our toe in an appropriate outfit that represents who we are and where we're going. And we want to take away any distractions uh, from a hiring manager being able to hear us. We really want them to hear what we have to say and what we have to offer. So in the same way, we want to organize our space and declutter. So we want to declutter our desk so that there's um, not open drinks that we could knock over. We don't want to have um, a lot of distractions in front of us. And we also really wanna make sure our background is nice and simple. We want to make sure that if we have a bookcase that our books are lined up nicely. Um, so, you know, a lot of us as, uh, you know, as students, we're in situations where, you know, you might have a room and that operates as many things for you, right? But take a look to see what's behind your background and try to simplify it. Um, in this picture, we have uh, someone that's got a window. And so if, and that window is to her right when she's got her camera um, towards herself. We don't want to have a window in our background because that puts the light behind us instead of on our face. So if we have a, a lamp uh, in front of us to either of those sides or a nice overhead light, it helps bring uh, good lighting to our face so that they can see your friendly, approachable, excited face that's really enthusiastic to be talking to this employer at this event. And um, we want to test out the technology and uh, the audio in advance of our appointment time to make sure that we're, we've updated the software and that our, our audio is clear. You might even check out your internet speed. Okay, so now we've prepared and we have a plan and we get to the day of the event. So we'll, we'll log on to Career Fair Plus and we go to that virtual career fair 
And we're keeping in mind that this appointment is in place of going to a physical event and walking up to a table and talking to an individual person. We'll have this appointment with an individual representative from a company. And um, the system, I believe, makes you have 10 minutes between each of your meetings. So you'll have plenty of time to get uh, from meeting to meeting. So you'll go to that virtual career fair. You're going to click to join the, the meeting at the time um, of your appointment, and then you'll knock. So once you've knocked on um, that, not, you've placed a knock with that employer, they, they will then bring you into the conversation. So keep in mind that they might be wrapping up a conversation with a student who had an appointment before yours. Don't worry if you have to wait a minute or two. Um, just, just wait for them to allow you into, into your individual meeting. You might double check if it's been a little bit longer to make sure that you have the, the right appointment time with the right employ, employer, but just, just wait. We'll make eye contact, strong eye contact with the camera. I know that that can be hard to do in the, in the virtual meeting, but we wanna treat the camera's lens like their eyes so that we can deliver a really strong elevator pitch. And as you continue your conversation with this employer representative, we wanna give tangible, concrete examples of our strengths and skills. So it's great if you say that, you're, that you have a strength or a skill or experience, but when you walk them through a tangible example, it makes it real to them and it gives them better in-depth knowledge of what you're capable of and how you could be successful with their organization. And that way with examples, we can connect our goals, uh, what we've done in the past, what we've learned in our courses to the company and the position. It's so important to be able to ask tailored questions. So keep in mind that if you have a 10 minute appointment time, you're, you won't have a chance to ask all of the questions um, that you might have about, about a role and about a company. And that um, this is the first stage of, of your communication. You're in the first stage of the selection process. So you're trying to tell enough about yourself and learn enough about the role to want to keep moving forward and to keep them moving you forward in the selection process. So at as you're creating tailored questions before your appointment, you wanna think of things that give you insight to the role and into the company that can't be answered by looking at a job description they have posted or by looking at their company's website and social media. Um, we wanna ask questions that get to the heart at, of what our values are and helps us understand whether this is a great fit for what we're looking for and whether um, our, our strengths and skills match up with the type of ideal candidate that they're having. You might ask questions that help you understand what types of projects you'd be working on in your first 90 days. It could be interesting to ask about the um, culture of the organization or the way people communicate or collaborate together. Right now, many companies have been have had staff working remotely, so it'd be interesting to know what technology or ways of staying connected um, that staff have, you know, have utilized while they are working remotely. So these are some of the types of questions. I'm sure you can come up with great questions of your own too to help inform um, what you need to know as you're moving along in this selection process. Asking questions helps show the knowledge that you have of their organization because you can dive deeper into a topic you've already talked about um, and it really shows your interest. It's so helpful to ask for the companies that employers representatives contact information, you might not be able to get it any other way. So if you've come to an on campus event in the past, you're likely to have asked someone for their business card. Um, so in lieu of being able to get a physical card, you'll want to make sure that you ask for their contact information. As you start your conversation, 
Um, whether you're at an in-person event or a virtual event, it's helpful to jot down someone's name as you start the conversation, maybe even to utilize it right away in your conversation by addressing them um, with, by their name in replying to a question. For example, you say, well, well thank you, Tina. Um, that's a great question. And then answer it so that you uh, familiarize, familiarize yourself with their, with their name. So let's talk a little bit now about after the appointment. We've delivered on our elevator pitch um, and had a great conversation with that employer and we've gotten their contact information. So now it's time to send a follow-up email. This shows uh, appreciation. Um, you can thank them for their time in participating in the virtual career fair and for uh, talking with you about their opportunities. And this allows you to start to start building your relationship with this, with this employer, whether uh, you're moving along in the selection process for this current role that you're seeking or in the future. We wanna move away from transactional thinking um, to really thinking about developing a relationship. So this is a nice way of looking at networking as building relationships and building rapport and creating yourself a community of people that you can reach back out to in the future. Um, on this current email, as you're following up, attach your resume. It can be the same resume that you gave them um, on the Career Fair Plus app, um, but by sending it directly to them now uh, by email, it helps jog their memory about what your qualifications were. And we can also provide an update on our application with, um, with that, that organization. So perhaps in, in your conversation, you talked about specific roles that they had posted or would have um, posted shortly, and you would have applied online and you can let them know, um, thank you for recommending I apply, that I apply for X position. I've done so now, um, just wanted to let you know so that you might be able to take a look at my, mater my materials. So this helps you get noticed. So instead of just being one of those candidates in the applic applicant tracking system, you, you got their email and you're sending them this specific note, which really reinforce your interests. And it also confirms your ability to follow through, which is a quality that everyone wants in a candidate. So you've met those employers, representatives, and you can, you can connect with them on LinkedIn. I think earlier you talked about um, personalized notes that you could um, create as you're requesting to connect with others. This gives you a chance to see what that employer representative posts. It might be information about internships or jobs or noteworthy news about the company. It can be tips for job seekers often. That's a lot of the material that we see that they post um, on LinkedIn. And then in the future, hopefully this appointment um, will lead to moving along in the selection process. And if you're interviewing in the, in the future, you can remind the employer how you connected and um, which virtual career fair at NC State that you participated in. So that's a little bit about my uh, best tips for making the most of the virtual career fairs in the spring semester to get you through the before phase when you're preparing through the event itself and then afterwards to follow up. Mark's that's fantastic, Kathleen. Wonderful. And we're so happy that you could pop in today for a few minutes to lend your expertise. Uh, let's just say students howl back with a big wolf pack. Thank you for Kathleen Fenner. We can't hear you, but we know in your house, you're howling Thanks for back having me, Mercy. Hi, Kathleen. That was awesome. I popped a few things in the chat, uh, folks, with some videos that will help you to follow up on some of the wonderful tips Kathleen mentioned about how to communicate with confidence. A podcast interview we did with Kelly Laraway, which is the director of our employer relations on virtual career fairs. We're all learning this with you, right, Kathleen? 
Yeah, absolutely. And those are great videos that you're you're referencing. Um, I strongly encourage students to take a look at those fantastic resources. Thank you, Kathleen. Have an awesome day. All right, students, next up is a poll. This is a very important poll. It is a very serious poll. So we started our afternoon off with a poll about the confidence level you have about your future. If you've already accepted a job offer, if you started applying, if you're in the middle. Sari is now gonna launch our next very serious poll. It's important, you're all staying with us. There's so many of you still here. It's important that you now respond to our next poll, which is about to be launched. Oh, it's the picture. Okay, perfect. So this relates to the poll. So, so students, please examine this photograph. It's important for you to look at it very closely. Um, one of these is my dog. I will not mention who. And one of these is the dog that was belonged to two of the alumni on the panel. And one of these is the dog that is belonged to uh, two other alumni on the panel who I know pretty well. All right. So, oh my gosh, you guys, you're killing me. I have to get this live on my Instagram feed as the results are coming in. This is wild. The Aussie is in the lead, um, but it's so nice. It's so neck and neck. Uh, the Sammy is so close behind. The, the results are still coming in, y'all. I am super excited to, um, to see what the result is. Wow. <laughs> I'm crushed. <laughs> I can't go on. All right. So the um, the Aussie won 42% to 39. Um, it is a beautiful dog, right? It really is. And um, I love it. All right. Thank you for your votes. Um, uh, I'm okay. I'm okay. I, I'm going to have to um, <laughs> share results. Oh, did I share it? Okay. There. You see, it's so close. All right. I just want you to know that the Sheltie is elderly and y'all are discriminating against the elderly. So let me now move on to the next screen share that I am going to do before I introduce our next guest. The next screen share is professional yoga, even better than me. So I am going to share this with sound um, so that you can now take a five minute break. If you need to run to the restroom, you can run to the restroom, but again, it's so important to take care of your body. It's so important to stretch. It's so important to move. So we are now going to do our yoga and we're going to do it in the chair this time. And I'm going to pick one of my favorite yoga instructors to lead us in. Oh, that's 15 minutes. Dang. I can't do that one. I really need to do five minutes. I want to do 15 minutes, but we got to get to some more career information. Oh, if you're feeling a little more Yay, Aditi. She's so awesome. And it's great to have a professional. <laughs> I was doing my best though with y'all. But what I wanted to tell you too, the interesting thing is with um, yoga, you have to take a break from, from your screen. You have to. Every hour, you must move your body. Please know that that is important to do. And I'm looking for Glenda. Glenda, you were here. Linda's internet dropped out, but she is working on it. Oh, she's coming back in a minute. Thanks, Courtney. No worries. Yes. Um, so while Glenda is coming back, um, I'm going to tell you again the importance of this uh, mental health and physical health. You can find these YouTubes anywhere. You can go directly um, and just type in yoga. I subscribe to Peloton, so I do that one pretty frequently. Meditations. We also mix those into my class. And like I said, I got a few seats left in USC 202. Um, Sari, would you like to unmute and tell our guest today why that class might be cool to take and why you took it and what you learned? Yeah, um, so I decided, I didn't know what I wanted to do going into my sophomore year. And so I decided to take it in the fall. I'm so glad that I did. It was like the class was such an eye-opening class. I learned so many different things. I didn't have a LinkedIn before I took the class. Now I do. I didn't know what a cover letter was. I didn't know how to make a cover letter. Um, and obviously like I learned that in the class and I like, if I could recommend everybody taking that class, I would, cause it, it helped me so much prepare for interviews and just like 
um, internships. So I really recommend taking it. Thanks, Sari. It's great to um, have you share that from a student to student perspective. Um, Courtney also gets very involved in a program called Career Identity. And I want to give her a chance to unmute her um, camera and microphone if she can to tell everyone who is trying to figure out what they want to be when they grow up, which is literally everyone in their 20s. I call it your trying 20s because we try lots of things and it feels trying. Um, why do you think career identity would be cool to take advantage of, Courtney? And what is it? Career Identity is really a great program for, like you said, students who are trying to figure out, like, what's my next step? What do I want to do with my major? What do I want to do with my career? And then, like, how can I make a plan to get there? I know there's a lot of anxiety around trying to make that decision and feeling like, what if I don't make the right decision? Um, spoiler alert, there's a lot of right decisions for most people. Um, so that program you can actually access um, on our website and it will take you, you self-enroll into a Moodle um, project space. And um, the Career Identity Program is open to all NC State students. It's typically geared more towards first year students, but let's be honest, like when I was a student, I was a senior still trying to figure out, okay, well, what am I doing? I had my major, but didn't exactly have my career path quite yet. Um, so that's just something that exists. You'll do activities. There are videos for you to watch. It's all self-paced which I think is another really great piece. So I used to teach USC 202 as well, and it's a wonderful class. If you have the free electives to take that, I highly recommend it. But if you don't have the free electives, career identity is a really great fit for you um, because of the fact that it does have a little more flexibility. You're not going to a class, you can do it when you want. And then you have access to career identity coaches and career identity advocates on campus. So you can meet with me, or with other people who are trained to know kind of what you're doing and what you're going through. Um, so really that's, it's just a support system. It's a program to help guide you through because like, how do you even start making that decision? How do you research? What kind of things are out there? I mean, it just seems so large and nebulous that it can be overwhelming. So we kind of give you a little structure around it so that you're left not guessing maybe what your next steps need to do, but you're feeling more like you know yourself and you know what you want out of your career. Because at the end of the day, it's all about helping you have a happy life after NC State and have a high quality of life. And a big part of that is being able to know what career you want. And then the other piece with events like this, with PAC Pros, which is another great video series we have, but helping you know what you want to do and how to get there. That's really everything that we do in our office. So um, if you do have questions about career identity, I will pop my email um, in the chat for you. Um, but that's a general overview of it. And I hope that you'll take advantage of it. Thank you, Courtney. And I appreciate you um, mentioning PAC Pros as well. If you can put the links to career identity and PAC Pros in the chat, then students, as a follow-up, you can go straight to these sites. And Courtney is too modest. She worked all summer updating these sites. She gamified them. So you get to compete and try to get to the top of the leaderboard. There'll be prizes given away. Some of you may have heard we're giving away Apple AirPod Pros at CareerCon February 21st. That's a Sunday. So we're going to pop that link back in the chat for any of you that may have gone away and come back and not seen the chat. Uh, so you'll be able to see how to get into career identity, PAC Pros. And if you don't know what that is, uh, you'll Click the link and figure it out. And also the link to CareerCon registration. All right, so all that is about to come into the chat. We have a new guest that just joined us. Um, and Courtney, thank you for doing all that copying and pasting. You're doing amazing. I'm so happy you're here. Um, Brian Newton, welcome. How are you today, my friend? Marcy, good to see you. I'm doing great. How's, uh, how's the uh, event been going today? The event is going amazing. We're having such a great chat. We've had experts from around campus joining us all afternoon long from every college. And I was telling students, we've never done this before. We have never gathered hundreds of people in a virtual space where we have all the top career experts from our campus together to impart wisdom. Isn't this fun? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really cool. I'm, I'm glad to be able to participate in it today. And uh, wow, what a great uh, what a great event that you're offering to everyone across campus. And I look forward to to learning more about how you pulled it off. 
<laughs> and, um, you know, and obviously uh, offering some insights into whatever I can do to help the students. Yeah, well, that's why I invited you to pop in, Brian, because when I find out that hundreds and hundreds of students registered, I was like, yikes, I need help. So Brian Newton is wonderful. He is the director of career at the Career Center um, in undergraduate programs at the Pool College of Management. So we know we have lots of management majors out there. Um, Brian has worked in this field for years at multiple universities, interacting yeah. with employers, um, supporting students throughout this process. Brian, you are an expert and thank you for making this time. And our conversation today is really about just now, January, New Year, everybody is pumped. They've got their goals set. They're like, I'm going to find an internship. I'm going to get hired. I'm a senior. I'm going to graduate during this pandemic. I'm going to get into grad school. I'm going to get a 4.0. Whatever goals people have, everyone is ready with this new fresh year. What are some of the things you think students should do between now and May to reach their goals, Brian? Yeah, absolutely, uh, Marcy. And um, I think there's a lot of things, you know, when we start this new year and have have all these great new goals, um, you know, I, I, I think even in this virtual space, there are a lot of things that we can do as we all, you know, continue to adjust and, uh, and, and keep moving forward in what we're doing. Um, you know, events like this that you're having on campus and other events that are uh, uh, held across campus and other colleges, I certainly think it's important for students to look on the websites, look on EPAC, um, just take note of all those different kinds of events. So, for example, in PCOM, um, we've got things coming up in January and February. We're actually doing two weeks of what we call career days, uh, January 25th through the 5th of February, culminating really in our fairs our virtual fairs for the students in, in the Pool College of Management. So That's be exciting, aware. That's exciting, Brian. And yeah, are, so these, be a, are these open to all students? Um, because I know Kathleen Fenner was just here talking about how to get ready for virtual career fairs. Yeah, yeah. So so those events are open to, to all students on campus. Uh, we've got, uh, we call our Employer Insight Series events where employers are offering really virtual information sessions uh, during those two weeks and even throughout the rest of the semester. Um, and then, for example, our fairs, of course, students are welcome to uh, participate in those virtual fairs uh, that are on the 4th and the 5th of February. Supply chain operations really focused on the 4th and then really overall business type majors focused on the 5th of February. Um, and again, using the Career Fair Plus platform. So, you know, in January, I think it's important now for students to really take note of all these different events that are across campus. Um, keep a list of those, add them to your spreadsheets, whatever you're doing as far as organization, but they're in EPAC, they're on websites, seek those out uh, all across campus and, you know, make your schedules and start participating in those. Yeah, um, there's, like you said, there's so many resources and we're all over campus. Like Brian is over in Nelson Hall and I'm in Pullen Hall and Kathleen's over in Design School and Jeff Sakharov's over on Centennial. And we're all working together. This is the thing is we have this safety net. We have been trying to pull in useful resources and you're here today. Hundreds of you are here today. All you need to do is check out these websites. Just say once a week, I am going to make sure that I'm up to date and pop them in your calendar. You know, that way you're going to take advantage of them. Right, Brian? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's a lot going on and it's a lot to keep up with. So, you know, uh, take note of them again, use the resources that we talked about as far as trying to find those events and, and keep checking back because things are changing. You know, we're still adding to our schedule. I'm in the process now of communicating with employers that want to do, be engaged with students on campus and in, in our college. So keep checking back because schedules are changing. Um, you know, I, I think too, Marcy, as we move into you know February and begin to get into the rest of the semester, I think things like, um, again, um, reaching out to alumni. Uh, I think that's critically important. You may have already talked about that, but that's one of the, you know, obviously key networking things that I think students should be doing. Um, we're all in this kind of virtual boat right now together. You know, it's, <laughs> we're all doing our, our thing from home and that kind of stuff. And uh, alumni, there's, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of what I like to call champions out there who are willing to help you as a student. Um, 
And so it's a matter of reaching out to them and, and either through LinkedIn, through in messaging, or if you have their company email address, um, but find some champions that are willing to have some really good career conversations with you as you get into February and March as part of your networking process um, and learn more about what they're doing, how they've had to do the pivot during, the, during this uh, pandemic and how their business is going and what suggestions would they offer to a student uh, doesn't matter what your major is to help you move forward in your career. Where are the internships possibly? What's going on in the business? I think that's another important thing. And again, I think alumni and others are willing to help break up their day with a good conversation with you. I, I'm so glad you said that because we did hit a little bit on that earlier in the day, but I want your opinion, Brian, because I think students sometimes feel intimidated to reach out. Let's say they go to LinkedIn, like we said earlier, they do the filter for NC State alums. They do the filter for maybe a keyword that's a, a functional job they want. Maybe they want to work in uh, analytics or they do, um, they want to work in San Diego, whatever filter they use. Yeah. And they're like, oh my gosh, I found 10 alums from NC State that are doing the work I want. Maybe they want to work at Google and they find, we actually had a Google alum here earlier that they can now connect to on LinkedIn. But if they didn't have that, like, and they're scared. What do you recommend about how to do that and not be intimidated? Yeah, great question. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, if you can just go ahead and begin to draft a message to that particular individual. And I, I we refer a lot of our students to use career shift. And I don't know if you've talked about career shift any that they can access through EPAC. But the real beauty in that is that you can generally get company contact information. So, uh, instead of trying to message them through LinkedIn, you can actually generally get their, their company email address, develop a really nice subject line that's not going to get deleted, something like, you know, NC State um, communication student seeking your advice, or NC State um, business student or marketing student um, seeking your feedback, or assistants doing some career research. OK, again, I think a lot of people are in this kind of helping mode and they're, and they're certainly if they're an alum willing to help current students and craft a really short, nice, explicit message about who you are and what you're seeking and and ask them if they could spare some time to have a conversation with you. And obviously you're keeping track of all this. You're putting your spreadsheets and remaining organized. But, I, you know. Yeah, you may have to, uh, um, you know, ping your message a couple more times to maybe that alum to see if they'll respond. But I think you'd be surprised that a lot of a lot of alumni and a lot of professionals will respond because they they feel like they they want to do what they can to help others, especially those that might want to go into their same career fields. Yeah, I'm so glad you you hit on career shift because we had not talked about that yet, and I just popped a link into the chat so students can follow up with career shift. How is that different than just finding someone on LinkedIn? Yeah, well, so you know, LinkedIn, you've got company information, you've got their job title, those kinds of things, but again, you don't per se have their explicit company email address or their phone number. Uh, and so that's, I think, the real beauty of career shift is that generally it'll give you that information. It's, it's a marvelous tool. It goes on the web and it finds all this information for you and brings it back into your search query. Uh, and then what's really cool about career shift is then you can export all this great information into spreadsheets. So if you're ser searching for technology contacts, finance contacts, communications contacts, engineering contacts. If you want to even narrow your contacts down to specific companies or regions of the country, I mean, you can do that. It's really a nice tool and it's something that our business students use quite heavily and we, we promote it quite heavily in pool. And you know what? I feel like it's the best kept secret, you know, because it's kind of, it's there, it's in EPAC, and now everyone knows how to log into EPAC and set up their profile and activate their accounts and, you know, upload their resume. They all have that link. And maybe um, Grant can pop that link in again, just because some people may be coming and going. Um, but EPAC is awesome. And that's where they find career shift. And students, if you don't do anything else after today, check that link out. I'm so glad you said that, Brian. What else are you thinking about um, students should be doing to reach their goals? Yeah, I think um, as well, you know, um, you know, if, if there are events that are may be offered by companies or other organizations that might be off campus, take a look at those. 
Um, there are other kinds of, uh, you know, career activities, virtual career activities that are being offered within communities. So what's what's the Raleigh community promoting or what is uh, some other areas of North Carolina promoting, maybe in your hometowns? Um, you'll see more and more virtual kinds of fairs and expos and those kinds of things. So can you participate in any of those? Um, another, I think, Marcia, a secret that I don't, not so much a secret, but I, I think a strategy that not a lot of students think about are those very important professional organizations and associations, okay? All of our professions, we have organizations and associations related to our fields, including us in career services. Well, as a college student, why not find out who those organizations and associations are, where are the local chapters, okay? Reach out to the leaders within those chapters and say, hey, can I participate in a virtual meeting? I'm a student, I'm pursuing engineering, um, mechanical engineering, finance, whatever, and I'd like to sit in on one of your meetings. They're probably not going to say no, <laughs> and it's a great networking opportunity, and hopefully maybe they'll introduce you and say, hey, this is, um, this is Brian Newton from the Poole College of Management. He's a finance major, and he's sitting in our meeting today. You know, what, an, what another great way, I think, to network with professionals that are in the field. Um, when we could do this in person, I've asked a lot of students to do that and have reported back that they've come away with stacks of business cards from these in-person professional chapter meetings that they go to at lunch or breakfast or whatever. Yeah, and now it's going to be LinkedIn connections because no one's holding cards anymore or shaking hands. So it's it's such a great idea to just Google um, whatever you want to be when you grow up. Like for, for me, I'm a career counselor. So you can be like professional association in career counseling. And you're right. These professionals, they're so excited to talk to students. It's like you're a breath of fresh air. You are the future of our profession yep. or whatever it is you want to be. It could be an engineer. It could be a scientist. It could be a textile designer. But all the people that work in those fields, they get lit up when it's time to talk to a student and give advice, right? It's fun. Yeah, yeah, and that's right. Bottom line is, you know, folks like us that are in, in professional um, occupations and organizations, we really like to talk about what we do, um, what do we enjoy about it, and how do we get to this place? You know, how do we get to enjoy so much about our job? And I think that's really um, what students want to try to focus on is try to find those champions again that I call them that really want to share with you what they do, why they do it, how they do it, um, and how you can be more involved in what they're doing. I love that. And actually, in my um, career class, Grant was my TA, and he did an interview with um, Gordon Hecker, who has designed this method called the Hecker Method of Networking. And it really helps students to realize networking is not a bad word. And, and Grant, was there anything from that that you, you'd love to summarize? Because you practiced some networking. You were scared, right? Yeah, I think kind of what, what Gordon preaches is Kind of preparing yourself and setting kind of a networking mindset beforehand um, you have to learn to accept and deal with rejection and of course it always sucks but you got to keep your chin up and then just being really methodical in your approach um, and take it day by day and maintain contact don't just reach out once continue building your network out and developing those relationships that's yeah, awesome great. Yeah, and Grant, if you want to pop that podcast, oh, actually the podcast hasn't come out yet. It's about to come out, y'all. So once you subscribe, Grant's going to put Wolfpack Career Chats back in the chat. Um, you can subscribe if you just look on Spotify, whatever you listen to music on. But his interview with Gordon is coming out. And I'm so proud, proud of Grant because he practiced it. I was like, all right, you're going to be my TA. Guess what? You're going to do this <laughs> stuff and see if it works. What do you think of that, Brian? Now that's awesome, and, and Grant did really touch on a really good point, is just being persistent um, with, with your networking. I mean, yeah, you're gonna have folks that don't respond to your emails. Uh, as I said, you might have to ping them a couple of times. That's okay, move on to another alum. Move on to someone else at that company. Um, there, I think you're, you'll find plenty of people that wanna talk with you, especially virtually. Um, and just, you know, like, like um, you know, with anything, put your toe in the water just a little bit with that. And, and as you begin to be more comfortable, you'll begin to wade out in the water just a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper. You, you certainly find out strategies and things that work well for you. Uh, and then you can start to utilize that. And these networking skills that we're talking about are things that you're going to use really for the rest of your life. Um, very valuable skills. And, and you know, what you're learning from this particular 
uh, virtual conference today, I think is, is again, skills you're going to learn for the rest of your life and use for the rest of your life. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a, um, a nonstop process. We talked about earlier, Jeff Sakharov mentioned, like, your resume is never done. And then Sarah right. Wilde mentioned, you know, you're always updating your cover letter. And Kathleen Fenner talked about how you keep interviewing at all these virtual career fairs. So it is an ongoing process. Brian, we're so happy you got to pop in today. Is there anything else you want to leave our uh, students with? There's hundreds of them listening and more on demand once we place the recording up. Now, I just I want to thank the students for participating in something like this. Um, you know, these kinds of things, uh, uh, you know, the, as far as career information that you're receiving, it's not something that every every student takes advantage of. And for, I think for you all that are here today and that have been participating, uh, you certainly begin to set yourself apart from other students uh, by learning what we're sharing. Uh, it's not necessarily rocket science. It's just stuff that we have learned over the years that we've seen that works well and um, that you can put in practice and, and we know that you can succeed as well. Thank you so much, Brian. How back okay. to Brian, Wolf back. <laughs> thank you. Everyone's howling at their house, Brian. Right. Have a great afternoon. All thank right. you for coming in. Thanks, yes. Marcy. Good seeing you. All right, bye. Students, this stuff is, um, we have you from all majors today. We have you all levels from bachelor's, master's, PhD. We have seniors, we have freshmen you have taken the first step today. I, I'm like, I, I, my heart is so big because like I've never tried this before. I was certain something would blow up and we're like cranking, we're doing so good. And my next guest is here. Given there would be a technology problem, Glenda had it, but she made it back. So, um, so ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Glenda Darrell. She is your career counselor for the College of Engineering and she actually lives with a mechanical engineer. Welcome Glenda. Thank you, everyone. And yes, congratulations to all of those who are attending and hanging out with us this afternoon. Um, my topic this afternoon is answering the question, should you take a gap year? And so I am going to uh, share my screen. Yes, and a lot of people during the pandemic are like, maybe I should just postpone everything in life, right, Glenda? Um, so we're not quite seeing your, we just see a black screen right now. Um, but if you're debating, if you want to take a gap year, this is a big question. What would you do during your gap year and how would you spend your time and how will that look to employers? So Glenda, we're not seeing your screen yet, but if you just want to talk about it, that would be awesome. Okay. Well, Continuing on to talk about, should you take a gap year? When you think about taking a gap year, one of the things that you need to think about is that a gap year is not, is not a- I am here, uh, just waiting for Michelle to join. Is not a year off. That a gap year is more like a year on. And so whether you take your gap year during your college years or between college and graduate school or before you enter the workforce, some people may have already taken a gap year between high school and coming to NC State. Either way, you need to think about what is your plan. And thinking about taking a gap year during a pandemic presents its own pros and cons. And so you and your family need to assess those pros and cons and think about how it would impact you. So ask yourself some questions. If a gap year is more like a year on than a year off, what are your goals for that gap year? Thinking about your field of interest in the midst of a pandemic, would it put you at an advantage or disadvantage to delay entering the job market or going to graduate school? Do you want to explore a career path? Do you want to pursue a personal challenge or spend a year in service? So all of those are questions that you need to ask yourself when you're thinking about what is my, going to be my gap year plan. So thinking about what are some of the pros and cons 
of a gap year. So thinking about the advantages of doing a back year, of a gap year. Some people doing a gap year means greater success for them in school when they return to school. Some people need that break. And when they return to school, they are more mature. They're more confident in themselves. And it translates into more success for them. Also, as I said, exploring career paths. So informing your next steps, a career path can help you determine what career path you may want to go on. Uh, I read an article recently about um, different ways that people were taking um, gap years and one high school student decided to take a gap year before coming to college because he decided that he was interested in the medical field and we're in the midst of a pandemic. And so he decided to take the year and work as an EMT. And so not only did he explore this career path and getting exposure to healthcare and the medical profession, but he also earned money that he could learn how to manage and have savings for when he went to college. Taking a gap year can also strengthen your resume. Just think about all that that high school student now has to talk about on his resume, as well as in interviewing in regard to his experiences working as an EMT. Also, during a gap year can be a good time to travel. Maybe not as much during a pandemic, but if you're an underclassman and you're considering, should I take a gap year? maybe between college and graduate school, then that's something that you may can start planning on is that travel. Because hopefully by then, we will be in a position to um, pick up where we left off in that regard. This is great, Glenda. And we have like one more minute for gap year. So would you please um, maybe summarize what you would like to end with? Okay. So in thinking about those pros, you also have to think about the cons. And so thinking about what is it that you need to know? Do you need to know your university's policies? Do you need to know about financial aid and how those policies and that financial aid may be impacted if you decide to take a gap year during college? So think yeah, that's about a really it. good point. So think about what is your plan? Thank you, Glenda. We really appreciate you coming in today and students who are in the College of Engineering, you will be able to follow up with Glenda through EPAC if you are sophomores through seniors. If you are a freshman, all of our freshmen in EPAC have an opportunity to get involved in career identity like you heard earlier. So big wolf pack, thank you to Glenda. Have an awesome afternoon, my friend. It was lovely to see you. Sorry you had some tech issues, but it happens and you had some great information. All right, students, we are cranking it down to the last few minutes. And what I want to end with is um, I want to show you the coolest thing that one of my students did with this screen share that I'm about to give you. And this is um, this is going to be I'm so glad you stayed till the end because like drum roll on this. This is going to be something I want you all to do. All right. So. I am now back to LinkedIn, and we had so many good questions on LinkedIn. I know Courtney and, and, and Sari and Grant were like, type, 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 you know. So Isabel, she was a student who graduated last May. She was panicking because she's graduating during a pandemic. So I suggested as part of our class that she post a YouTube commercial about herself on LinkedIn and then tag various places that she wanted to work. This is one of the things I was mentioning to you earlier, how important it is to be active on LinkedIn so that people see that you're involved. Like Gabby had that great article and Devon had all of those wonderful artifacts. 
Well, this is a YouTube that any of you can create. You can do it on Zoom if you would like to. Um, Grant has also done one of these. And when I'm done, I might give him a, a chance to say what tips he has. But let me just show you. This was posted on LinkedIn. And she had hundreds of comments and likes and got an amazing job as a result. So let's take a look at Isabel. Hello, my name is Isabel Rocco, and I'm really excited to have the opportunity today to share a little bit about myself, my strengths, some unique qualities that I can bring to your organization um, virtually today. So some quick, fast facts about me. I am majoring in communications with a concentration in public relations and a minor in nonprofit studies. I'm graduating this May from NC State University, and I've gained experience in both the public and private sector through various internships in the marketing field. I've worked heavily in the nonprofit sector and also have TA'd, and I'll get a little bit more into those experiences in depth later on. My Myers-Briggs is an ESF I'm extroverted, sensing, feeling, and judgment. And then I am also just searching for a job in the communications field. I would love to also work in the nonprofit sector if possible. And I have some experience in higher education, so I'm really interested in that field as well. So diving a little bit deeper into my previous work experience, I am the current marketing. So I'm going to pause here, um, but I wanted you to see a peek of that. And like I said, if you just type her name in on LinkedIn, you can connect to her and say, I saw you in my boot camp today. Um, she is doing an amazing job in communications right now. She is very successful. This seems bold. This seems like it's going to take a lot of time, but you can do it. You are the overachievers. You are the go-getters. You would not be here the week before school starts listening to a three-hour webinar unless you were super motivated. And let me tell you, you're already standing out from the pack. So I wanted to give you that tip today. Um, and again, like I was kind of speeding up her, her voice. You all never do that when you listen to my videos in my class, I know. But the, the cool thing about this presentation is what's important about me. It's so much. It's almost like a mini interview right here on a link. It's posted as an article. And all of these professionals are like, that girl is a standout. And of course, that's what they said. Also want to show you the, um, the SoundCloud links I was referring to earlier. So I'm switching tabs back over to the podcast. This is a really great one to listen to for career fairs. Um, this is the great one to listen to if you were hoping you were going to get a lot of tips on how to find a job or internship during a pandemic. You will get it by listening to this one. It was a few months ago, but it was chocked full of wonderful information. And oh yeah, this is the YouTube account. So I want to open that really quick to show you that um, if you go to my YouTube, if you just type my name in YouTube, you can go ahead and see about 70 different 10 minute videos. And this is the one where I talk about all of the different career readiness traits that I mentioned earlier. Um, also have a great Twitter account. There I am pictured with my lovely mask on. Um, if you just want to be inspired and find out about some things that are happening weekly, it's Wolfpack Career Chats. Let's see what other tabs. Ooh, these were all the questions that you asked earlier. Thank you all for posting those on Padlet. And with that, we're going to finish early. I know you guys love it. You never, you're never sad when you get extra time. And maybe because it's a pretty day, you can walk outside. But I want to turn back to Courtney Mulvaney and ask her, um, well, first, Grant, do you want to say anything about posting the YouTube on your LinkedIn um, before we wrap up with Courtney? Yeah, so um, I think it's a great opportunity because the pandemic has allowed a lot of us to um, learn how to use Zoom. And Zoom is a good tool to, to make your video with since you can um, make like a little presentation and then screen share and record yourself um, doing a little personal branding introduction. And, you know, it doesn't have to be something that looks like it was produced by a professional or anything like that. Um, but I think it has the opportunity to impress a lot of people when 
when someone would watch it and be like, wow, they took the time to, you know, make this video. It's not something that's um, pretty uh, conventional. It's something that very few people do. So I think that it would be well worth your time. Um, and you can find resources online on how to, how to make a good video. Yeah, or you can email Grant. <laughs> Grant's like, yay, hundreds of people will be emailing me. But, um, you know, all the resources are online. Um, some people use YouTube, some people use um, Zoom, whatever tool you like. All right, so let's get back to you, Courtney. You want to let people know what else is coming up. Of, of course, we've talked about CareerCon, um, but there's more, right? We always have stuff going on. I think that um, that's kind of what I'm, I'm closing with. Y'all had a lot of great questions and a lot of very specific questions. So I wanna show you some of those things that I kept repeating in the answers um, and some of the other programs that we do have in our office um, in the Career Development Center. So I am going to actually share my screen, which is gonna be awesome. Yeah, Courtney was going crazy with your questions. I'm, I, I don't know how you kept it together. I, I mostly did. <laughs> <laughs> so, Awesome. So here is our website and our website is where you are going to find all of our information. And I mentioned EPAC a lot. You will find the link to EPAC on our website. When you have questions, you also can email us directly. Our contact information is down here. We are the Career Development Center. But some of the things that we talked about most was um, the career guide, making appointments on EPAC, and then um, some of our other programs. So exploring careers is where you will find information like the career identity program that we spoke about, as well as our career assessment, which is the focus too, which is free for you to take as an NC State student. It can help give you some new ideas about what kind of careers and majors might be a good fit for you. So if you're not sure where to start, career identity and the career assessments are a great place. Gain experience has a lot of information about um, how to get ready and, and really prepare for those careers. So the career guide is kind of your go-to document PDF for all things career related. Resume examples, cover letter examples, information on the career readiness competencies, pretty much everything we do is a, a nice little snack of it in the career guide. In addition, I mentioned PAC Pros. If you like videos, short, snappy from career ambassadors, not just us, so some of your peers, um, can teach you about some of those topics in depth on demand. And you can earn your PAC Pro certification, which is also a nice resume booster for those of you looking to add more experience to your resume. We also have the co-op program, the rural works program, and many video tutorials that you can find on our website for your use. So I want you to know that information is out there and readily accessible for you who have those great questions. And you can always meet with a career counselor. And the best way to do that, in my opinion, is just by typing in something as simple as go.ncsu.edu slash EPAC or literally Googling EPAC. When you do that, this is the site you'll see. You choose the student, and then that's going to allow you to sign in with your Unity credentials. EPAC really is your go-to place to search for jobs, internship opportunities, co-op opportunities, and like I said, to make an appointment with your career counselor. We're here, we're starting to take appointments, and you are going to be able to meet with someone who can help you with your individual problems. So I'm really glad I got to answer your questions today, and I'm going to turn it back over to Marcy to close us out. That was really helpful, Courtney. And another thing that um, students can do is our drop-ins, right? And Glenda, I think, is still here. I'm just checking in with her because she might even be able to tell us, um, I think drop-ins start the first day of school. Can you tell us what those are and how students take advantage of them? Okay. Yes, the Career Development Center offers drop-in hours um, every day that class is in session. And so... Um, next Tuesday, January 19th, um, the first day of class, um, the Career Development Center's drop-in hours will begin. They will be Monday through Friday from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m., and they will be done virtually. And so when you go to our website, as Courtney just showed you, the Career Development Center website, um, there will be um, a, there's information there on making appointments, and there's information on drop-in hours, and there will be a link there to the to the virtual drop-in hours and so you'll click that link and drop in 
um, between one and three, and there will be a career counselor there to answer your questions. Thank you, Glenda. Your internet is, is a little bit glitchy, but we got the gist of it. And Courtney maybe can pop the link in for drop-ins. Like Glenda said, every day school's in session, one to three, you can go to this link and I'm guessing you're in a waiting room and then you'll get invited in when it's your time. So it's kind of a first come first serve thing. We used to do it in person. Now we're doing it all virtual. So many resources. All right, so I wanna tell you, I promise I'm finishing five minutes early, but I have like something really important to end with. So I want you all to pull out your phone, all right? You all have your phone attached to you, I know you do. And what I want you to do is I want you to go to wherever you take notes on your phone. It could be your calendar. I use mine in Google Keep. I, I love where Google Campus, so I just open Google Keep and I can take a picture of a recipe or whatever I wanna remember, a restaurant somebody tells me and I color code all this information and it's like up in the cloud for me forever. So start a new note. I want you to write down the number one thing you're gonna do after today's session during the month of January. One thing you're going to do, maybe it's going to be, um, what is today, Wednesday? Maybe it's going to be Wednesday, Thursday or Friday. I know you're all moving in, doing crazy stuff. You're busy. What is one thing you're going to do? Maybe it's go on to career shift and, and email an alum. Maybe it's update your LinkedIn profile. Maybe it's make an appointment with a career counselor. Maybe it's register for career con. So that is going to be your accountability note. You can write it on a post-it if you're old-fashioned, or you can type it in your phone. Also want to remind you, um, this is, this is kind of your, this is my to-do list. If I don't put it on my list, it does not get done. It's got to be on my calendar. Also, Instagram. I know a lot of you love hanging out on Instagram. Follow the Career Development Center on Instagram. Here is our post for today. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a really great picture of Catherine who was on the video. Um, it says to check it out. All the things posted on Instagram are run by students and there are new weekly stories. So that's just another great way when you're on your phone scrolling through social media to just make sure you are staying involved. Now, the last thing I told you I was going to end with, what is the number one thing, if you read my email, that you should do to make yourself more marketable during a pandemic? The number one thing. So I am going to pop a link into the chat right now, which is called, How Do I Access LinkedIn Learning as an NC State Community Member? So I am copying now. And I'm going to send this to all of you before I was just sending things to um, my panelists. And thank you, Sari, for telling me I need to send that to all students. So here is the link. Oh, there's the link to the um, thank you, Courtney, for the Instagram. Here is the link I want you to copy and paste and put wherever you need in another window. This tells you how to access LinkedIn learning. The number one thing you can do during this pandemic to make yourself stand out. This is the link I just sent you. And we're gonna go back to our LinkedIn. Once you join based on the LinkedIn instructions on that page, you will have this magical button on your LinkedIn. It costs thousands of dollars to get it if you're not at a university or company that has purchased it. These are all professional development credentials you can gain while you're a student and you can post them on your resume or on your LinkedIn. Now for me, I'm apparently needing to write with proper punctuation um, or maybe that's just popular, but that's coming up. How to make work more meaningful. Sounds good to me. Data-driven decision-making for business professionals. So I also have a section here where it shows me all the things that I've already done because I like to walk my dog. By the way, he's a Shetland sheepdog named Mojo. And listen to these when I am outside on a beautiful day. So here it says top picks for Marcy. Well, it doesn't surprise me that it's something about leadership, something about project management, resume. Yes, I like talking about resumes. Credibility as a speaker. As you know, I do lots of speaking. What's trending now on LinkedIn Learning? Ooh, cool. Well, how to rock the interview. Um, I kind of think that would be a good one to listen to, but y'all know it because you listen today. Also, learn communication. Okay, this is just like an example for you. Tri 
This is, you might be going, I'm taking classes. I don't have time to do LinkedIn learning on top of it. And that's okay. But you could do a couple modules in the next weekend before classes start on Tuesday. So that's what I want to leave you with, Wolfpack fans, LinkedIn Learning. I'm so grateful that you came today. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for making this program so meaningful with all of your questions. This might be the first webinar you've ever gone to before because you've been in Zoom meetings and many people were saying, what do I wear? And I was like, I don't care what you're wearing. You could see I was barefoot because I was doing yoga because uh, I'm not going to see you. Thank you to Grant. Thank you to Sari. Thank you to Courtney and Glenda who are still here. And we are going to end now, friends. Take care. Go pack.